Episode 26 is with Geraint Jones, who served with two Royal Welsh in Iraq and Afghanistan during the peak of both conflicts. He is the host of the Veteran State of Mind podcast and now New York Times and Sunday Times best-selling writer. I want to thank Geraint for providing such a detailed and honest look into his military career. He had the benefit of not being tied down to a particular unit and had more options ava available to him on his deployment schedule. He deployed back to back to Iraq and landed in Afghanistan in the summer of 2009. We talk about the appeal of war and why young me men who have experienced it are welded to it for life and the inevitable tragedies that come from the exciting and primal environment. Geraint wrote Brothers in Arms which came from the journaling of his 2009 deployment to Afghanistan. On the success of that, he was requested to jump into writing professionally and has since published 12 books. I urge you to check out his podcast and give him a follow on Instagram at GRJ Books or at Veteran State of Mind. And without further ado, the Lead Wasps podcast episode 26 is live. Oh, zero four zero Alpha, confirm that's bombs dropping on Man's track. Fucking hell! <laughs> Listen, mate, I, I do appreciate you fucking taking the time out of your day. Um, I, I know you've got a, a lot of shit going on in your personal life with the podcast and the book and everything else. So, yeah, I, um, I definitely appreciate it, mate. No pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Right, let's start off right with this one. How the fuck did you get Tulsi Gabbard? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I know. I think we should we should uh, clear up what you mean by that. How did I get her on the podcast? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, well, so. first of all, let me turn the volume up a little bit. Um, so I was um, before I came back from America. I was out there. One of my mates, Paul De Gelder, he was um, um, he was uh, Australian clearance clearance diver. Um, which is like a bit of an elite unit out there. And then he got attacked by a shark, uh, bit, his arm, uh, bit his arm off, bit his hand off, took out a massive chunk of his leg. Um, and then he ended up getting, not only got, did he get back to his unit and continue with the clearance divers, but then he started doing work with um, Discovery Channel. Now he's a Shark Week presenter on there. Damn. So he's mad, mad fucker, yeah. Um, does like free diving with sharks. So it was be just before I left America, it was me um, and the other guy was with us. You might know Rudy Reyes from Generation Kill. Right. Um, so Ru Rudy is a friend of mine out in the States. So me, him and Paul had our little boys night before I came back. So we were a lot of beers deep. And I was talking to Paul about, um, I think it was because I was talking to, we were talking politics, as you do on the sesh. And he was like, oh, <laughs> start to talk about Tulsi. And I was like, oh, I'd love to have her on the podcast. And then a couple of minutes later, Paul goes, Tulsi says she'll do your podcast. I'm like, what? He's like, look. And I was like, how do you know her? Because he's one of those guys who just knows everyone. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I met, he's like, I met her at dinner with mates. She said she'll do it. And I was like, I oh, can't be Jen. And I texted her. She's like, yeah, I'll definitely do it. We had a chat on the phone. But yeah, I'd like to think that she'd yeah, like, consider her a mate now. She's sound as fuck. And I wish she was president, to be quite honest. I think the world would be a better place for it. Listen, um, I first discovered her, her on the Joe Rogan podcast and that lady is a lady that you can get behind. Like, even being yeah. British, I listen to her talk and I listen to her make complete sense. No politi political bullshit that you hear from them all. No, you know, there's no subversive tactics, uh, subversive tactics, submissive, what's the fucking word? Subversive, subversive tactics. Yeah, yeah there's, there's nothing that's, uh, that's trying to, you know, she's trying to, pull the wool over anyone's eyes it's a goddamn patriot that you can get behind and the democrats shot themselves in the foot because now if it comes down to it and they don't get the they don't get the runoff after all these legal challenges then you know that's that that's the end of that party for as far as i can see for for a long yeah. time but they could have had it they could have had it with her they could have had it with bernie uh and they fucking kissed it with uh with basement biden the thing is with with the with that though is you and me are looking at it from a point of view of what's best for the American people. And what's best for the American people would be a president like Tulsi or a Democratic candidate like Tulsi. But we need to distinguish that there's what's best for the, for the 
American people and what's best for the few people who will benefit from having, like, because, you know, people, so for people that don't know, Tulsi, she absolutely destroyed Kamala Harris in, um, in debate and, and just by using facts. I was just by to say that. It wasn't because she was, yeah. you know, any, any much, she clearly was a better debater, but it wasn't because she outsmarted her or anything. She just exposed the truth about her. Yeah, and then um, basically what happened was Tulsi was clearly, um, she was clearly like a, the best candidate out of that debate. So what they did was, there's a, there's a bunch of fuckery as well, because like Google, they had like, or they had a, all these Google AdWords. So when people went and searched Tulsi after the, after the debate, that people would be able to find out more about her. Basically, um, I, I don't know, I can't remember the exact details, but it, it's along the lines of, Google restricted all searches on Tulsi for a 48-hour period after the debate. Um, I'd st- I think they've got a lawsuit ongoing again about it. Um, and then the other thing as well was um, Hillary Clinton came out and said Tulsi is a Russian asset. She had like no, there was nothing behind it. But like the reason she said that was because Tulsi went to speak with, with Assad to see if there's any way of yeah. the end of the war. Because the thing is, people are like, well, why would he do that? Like, look. It always used to be the way that leaders of countries used to speak to each other. Because if there's any, she said this herself, if there's any way of preventing service people and civilians dying, then it should be used. Like, but uh, Hillary Clinton came out and said she's a Russian asset. Mainstream media ran with the story. No evidence to back it or whatever. Now you talk to people, because you know what it's like, mate. Most people don't actually bother their ass to do any research. So you say, oh, like, I'm a big fan of Tulsi Gabbard. Oh, I heard she's a Russian asset. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because mainstream media put it out there. Uh, and I think, to be honest, mate, that's really when I lost my faith in American politics because I thought, here is, she checks all the boxes. She's a woman. She's a woman of color. She's a veteran. She's, she's not beholden to anybody. She loves America, clearly. She's willing to go above and beyond. She's not, like, nobody owns her. Um, and they sank her. And I thought, oh, Jesus, it's not about the best candidate. And that's, that's a really scary realization. It kind of it kind of shows the shows the the hand in of politics as well, you know, because the 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 left or the the Democratic Party in in America, let's say, but the left in general would would see themselves as the party of acceptance of it and, and inclusivity and of the party that uh, you can pick yourself up out of nothing and make yourself the president. But that clearly isn't the case because Tulsi is that Tulsi's someone who. You know, like you said, she's a she's a veteran. She's a a god, goddamn fucking American hero in my eyes. You know, just because she is such a great candidate for the country, and it's another misconception that you think that military members or even like people on the right or most of the people are center. Most of the people are center left or center right. Like for myself, like in terms of lifestyle stuff, I'm left. Um, but in terms of like fiscal stuff and just in general like um, government involvement, I'm 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 right, but so that, that that then puts me in the middle. Most people that are that, especially most uh, most military people, and it's definitely something that goes over people's heads that the Democrats could easily have a, a whole heap of these people who are leaning right if they just had the right candidate. Like, and people aren't affiliated to to parties like like the the media or, or like the narrative would have you believe. It's so easy for people who might be Republican to go and vote for a, a, a person like Tulsi Gabbard because they just make sense. And they, when you have a, a candidate that is so clearly presidential like she is, then there's no question about party politics. It's like, right, I want that one. But then it's when these when the conventions happen and the, the parties pick their, their candidate, then that's it. That's, that's the real fucking robbery of the American people right there before it even gets to the votes. You don't get to decide who you want to run. You have to pick out of the fucking... The two, <laughs> the yeah, two, the two fucking craziest candidates in, in the whole of America. Yeah. America is one of the greatest countries in the world. It's definitely not the greatest because fucking goddamn Britain's the greatest, but it is it is up there. And to have the type of people that you have running for for these for office like that, it's 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 absolutely insane. You could you should have some fucking genius running that country. You know what I mean? Rather than a, a businessman and a fucking zombie. Well, most people don't want to touch it, mate. That's the problem. So it takes a patriot like Tulsi to, like, that's not going to be the best life for her, but she's willing to do it because she sees it as patriotic duty. Yeah. Um, most of your smartest people in the country, they don't really have that sense of patriotism. But let's be honest, those smartest people in the country, they are actually running the country. They're just doing it from behind the face of Biden or Trump or whoever yeah. wins, you know. 
Um, I, I, I just think that like, I, I, one of the things that always pisses me off is people will be like, oh, well, it could be worse. You could be in Iraq. Or, yeah, it could be worse, but it could be better. So I, 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 I fucking hate the argument of people saying it could be worse. Those are the usual people who don't bother their ass to do anything in their own fucking life. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I just think like, yeah, it, it could be worse, but I, I honestly don't believe that America is a democracy. I, I don't think it is. It's, it's an oligarchy. You know, you've got a few rich people running the country. And just because you give people the right to choose between the two people that have been presented to them, that's not democracy. Because like you said, that doesn't cover really what people want. A democracy would be, right, here's all these issues. Where do you want to vote on each one, right? This is what we do. That's a democracy. It's not a democracy when you say rich or white guy, rich or white guy. Which rich or white guy would you want? Yeah. You know, so I, I just, is it better than a lot of countries? Absolutely. But it's not democracy. People should stop pretending it is. Yeah, um, I mean, I could talk politics all day, and I, and I know you could as well. Um, <laughs> okay, right. I'm trying to stop, though, mate. I'm trying to stop. Yeah, I'm. I'm no, bro, I had to take myself off of the off of the media platforms. Like, I don't see myself as being negatively impacted. I just see myself as getting, or, or not even emotionally negatively impacted. I just see myself spending a, a, that little bit too much time in it, and I, I really don't need to. You know what I mean? Like, there's not much yeah. change that I can affect, but where I can affect change, I'd like to think that I'm doing it. I like to kind of back up my bullshit as well and hold myself accountable um, wherever I can do. Um, and I'm sure you're the same. But listen, it's a military podcast, so let's get into that, that side of the... A bit of pew-pew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you don't mind, mate, would you give your, uh, give the listeners a, a quick introduction of, of who you are, mate? Um, so I want to, always wanted to join the military. I went through a fast jet pilot phase, like most people do. Um, I thought I want to be a fast jet pilot. Then I started to. Then I thought, no, I need to be need to be in infantry. My local regiment was Royal Welsh Fusiliers at the time, um, and I thought, right, that's it. I'll go into them. Um, I thought I'd go in and do a commission. So when I was, um, I went, my my great uncle, he joined the army at the beginning of the war, Second World War, and he went right through from private to full colonel. Um, so I told him that I was going to do it, and he was like, right, have you spoke? The regimental secretary i had no idea what that was because when we had army when i got into the army careers office they don't tell you about like the officer path and stuff so i, I got in touch with the regimental careers office um then the idea was going to be that i did i, I figured oh, i'll go to like otc the officer training court at university because after i do sixth form um but the um they had the ta center where the regimental headquarters was so um the regimental secretary who's like a retired major he took me across to the guy who's like, he was the permanent kind of like officer at the TA center. And he, he was like the ex RSM of the Royal Welsh. So yeah. it was a great person to go to. And he's like, look, you can go to OTC or why don't you join us? And we'll put you in as, cause this is at a time when there was still platoon signalers around. And he's like, we'll put you in as a platoon signaler and you can like understudy, uh, understudy officers, um, get five years under your belt in the TA as an enlisted soldier. And then when you finish uni, go for, go for commission. I thought that sounds like a really good idea. Bear in mind, this is the year 2000. So there's nothing going on. Yeah. Like when I, when I joined, I, I generally thought it was just going to continue being your, your probably your Bosnias, your Kosovo's, that kind of stuff. Like I had no idea there was going to be an Iraq or an Afghanistan happened. Yeah. So I thought that sounded awesome. Um, and then, it, so I did that for a couple of years. That's some good experiences. Uh, 2011, obviously 9-11 happened. So that started to change things because some people started to get mobilized to go to Iraq. But even so, I thought, because once you'd missed, I, there was no way I was going to be on the invasion. And the early telex, to be honest, didn't seem that like, there didn't seem to be that much going on on them. So I thought, I, I can wait. Um, but there was a few things that changed my mind about the officer route. It was I went down to do my regular commissions board. I had a pretty bad experience down there with the, the uh, officer that was kind of... Um, Basically, and I'm not playing the race card here and stuff because I, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy with how things worked out. But she basically told me because I wanted to go to Cardiff University and I wanted to join the Royal Welsh. Uh, I was I was told by her that I, um, I needed to realise it was the British Army, not the Welsh Army. So she clearly had a chip on her shoulder about the Welsh. I have no idea why someone, you know, fucking husband probably cheated on her with a fucking Welsh tart or something. <laughs> but at the time, this was before we have all the, the kind of awareness we have now about like bigotry and stuff like that. And like, I do think it's overplayed, but at the end of the day, like 17 year old me should have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. I want to go to Cardiff Uni because it does the best. They did the best. Uh, they, they're one of the best unis for history in, in, the, in the country. Uh, I want to join the Royal Welsh because my local regiment and granddad was in it. 
So, but I didn't fight. I didn't push back on it. So they said you could come back in. They, they said you could come back and do it again. And I just, I got to be honest with you as well, mate. Like I'm from, um, I'm from like a middle class family, but we've always lived in like working class areas. And all my mates have always been like working class. I went to a normal comprehensive school. I played rugby. Um, I didn't feel like I fit in with the people that were on the commissioning board. Um, there was like one or two of us that just ended up grouping together. They were a couple of uh, Lance Jacks that were going for a commission. Yeah. I just didn't, just didn't fit in. And it was the same as when I was at uni. When I went to uni, I stopped playing rugby because it was a bit, it was the fucking rah-rah boys and stuff. And uh, didn't want anything. I looked at the OTC there, didn't want anything to do with it. So I stuck with a TA. And, um, so I, I just I just didn't feel that like, off oh, was for me, but I still figured I'd end up doing it. But I thought, well, a good idea to be to go out to do, go out to Iraq, get a tour under my belt, and then, um, then go for a commission. Um, and I don't know if I wanted to go with this, but basically once I went out to Iraq, I just realized that like, officer life was not for me and I just wanted to carry a fucking GP. <laughs> <laughs> so what year did you head out to Iraq then? So this is like for anyone, because I'm sure you have people listening who aren't in the army yet that want to be, right? So this is a very valuable lesson that I learned that you that take heed from what I, what I learned. The army don't care about you and the army cannot do paperwork. Those are two things you need to know. So... I was told, I was like, so I was probably, I finished uni, so I was like, what, 20, 21, 22? And I was trying to get out to Iraq as soon as possible. I started to try to get out on Telic 7. It was Telic 9 by the time I got out there because every, my paperwork would go missing. This officer would say this. This woman at Glasgow would say that. I put, like, and then my paperwork would go missing again. Like, for you or for me at that time, going to Iraq was the most important thing in the world. But to, the, to them, you are just another, you're a PID, a PID number that they don't give a fuck about. Now, if I'd have been a bit, or like if that happened now, I would know that the way you get stuff done is to be on the phones with someone every day until they get so sick of you that they fucking put your paperwork through. As it was, I was like, oh, I can't rock the boat, all that kind of shit. And because of it, I spent a year, and it, it was one of those ones as well where it was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll be going the next week. So I'm like, oh, well, there's no point in me getting a job then, is there? So I do a bit of laboring or something like that. And then two weeks later, oh, no, well, we've got to start the process again. And before you know it, a year and a half, my life's gone. Um, and then when I did get, um, I was hoping to go out on, um, so obviously yeah, anyone knows Telic 8, things started to get a bit, a bit punchy out there. And um, I, I was hoping to go out with a, either the Stafford's battle group or, um, or two Lanks. Both of them were warrior battle groups. And I wanted to do armored infantry. Um, and then when I finally got my fucking paperwork, it was for a TA, like a composite TA company, which was going to do like force protection. Uh, and I was fucking devastated because I knew that that was going to be, that was not going to be the punchy stuff. Um, and I remember, so I went, that, that same guy that was the one that got me in the TA, I went to speak with him and I was like, sir, this is, I, I want to be like, I want to be fucking scrapping. Uh, and he was like, look, like, this is your paper, like you can go out, it is a thing. If you don't take this now, you're not going to end up out there at all. If you take this, at least you're out there, and then maybe you can make something happen. So I was gutted, to be honest, mate. Like, I can't remember. Like, it's like I literally, when I got those orders to go with that TA company, I felt sick. Like, I felt sick because I knew I was like, I knew that there was going to be fighting going on with, because um, again, you can't see the future. As it turned out, I've ended up doing a few tours. At the time, I thought that was my one chance and it was gone. Um, so I was devastated. Um, and I, so I went out there, um, and like, to be fair, like it, there was a lot of good lads that I was, that I was with, but the majority of that company were not blokes who were out there cause they wanted to fight. A lot of them were out there because they wanted to do a reasonably safe tour. They wanted to get the photos. They wanted to get the LSA days, you know, um, they wanted to say that they'd been in Iraq, but I'd say it was less than a quarter of that company actually wanted to close with the enemy and fucking drop, you know, drop fucking bodies. Like it yeah. just, it just wasn't that. And it was a very, very frustrating place to be. Uh, as luck would have it, when I got out there, my team, so I just got made up to Lance Jack just as we went out. Uh, and I just, I got really lucky and I ended up in, a, in the best, like I would say the best team in the entire company. Um, and we got put on a, the, basically we got seconded to Ato. So for those that don't know, they're the guys that like your hurt locker guys, basically. Um, we got put with them to be their full-time force protection. So yeah. I was like, fucking hell, this has worked out. 
this has worked out fucking mega because now like there was four of us. It was like first name terms with the ATO guys. They were brilliant and we were just getting crashed out to course and we were just going out to IED after IED after IED. Um, I worked out really well. I was like, fuck, this is actually, I've landed on my feet here. This is actually fucking mega. Um, no stag, no nothing, because we just don't immediately notice to move all the time. But that's then the, this is... A, that's a key point there, isn't it? No stag. Yeah. There was no stag, mate. Like, we literally, we'd hang out at the ECOS, um, you know, like the NAFI and stuff. We hang out there and then we just go out on calls and then we come back. We go out, we come back, we go out, we come back. We're just going out loads because there's IEDs all over the place. Uh, and it was awesome. Um, but this is again when the TA can mess you up a bit. So in the regular army, you have, I would say, a very strictish standard for each rank. So um, if you're a full screw, you've had to have passed junior Brecon, which is what, is it six months altogether with skill at arms? Uh, four. Uh, four months. Yeah. So you've had to have done that. And there's a very standard thing. To get full screw in the TA, you just have to do a two-week course for your Lance Jack, which is the one I did. And then you have to do a two-week course for your um, full screw. And they're under a lot of pressure to pass people. Like junior Brecon for, for regulars will not pass people unless they're ready. Whereas it's the opposite more when you go on the TA one, it's more you have to fail rather than you have to pass. Yeah. It makes sense. So because of that, our Orbat shook up a lot in the first month there because they were finding out they had sergeants and full screws and stuff who just couldn't do the job. So you ended up with sergeants doing, and this is, kind of, this is wrong as well, really, because you end up with sergeants doing, uh, sergeants doing Lance Jack jobs, Lance Jack doing full screws job, but you're only getting paid as a Lance Jack. But yeah. you're doing someone else's work. And, and basically what happened was I got took out that four-man team to go and take over a team in another platoon. So I got changed platoons and everything because they tried to do a few platoons with this other guy and he was just going to get someone killed. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of that in that company. Now, I want to stress as well, there were some lads in that company who were some of the best soldiers that I ever worked alongside. But without doubt, there was also uh, some very there was some bad ones. And and it wasn't the lad's fault a lot of the time. It was just, you just haven't had as much training. You know, so when I, I'm a big fan about put, of putting TA into regular units. I'm a massive fan of that because that knowledge across the board brings you up. Yeah. But when you've got a whole group of lads and most of them haven't done any tours, like, and here's, here's the messed up bit as well. So going into that tour, you know, some, there's some TA lads there who have got full screw. They've got sergeants because they've never deployed before. And every summer they go and do their two-week, three-week course. Where there's other lads who have deployed the two years before doing six-month tours every year. So the experience in a regular battalion is the higher you go up, usually in the NCO ranks, the more tours. Whereas in the TA company, you had privates in there with two tours who were on the third tour but sergeants were zero tours. So it was very messed. It was like the whole thing was like upside down. Yeah. Um, and, and there was, and like I said, it, it was just very, it was frustrating because there were some blokes in there who just, just did not want to, you had like some privates and stuff who were like 45 years old who just, they're, they're not there to fight. Yeah. And like, if you're there to fight, that's very hard to, to, to deal with. I, uh, you know, I'll t I took advantage of that on my own personal career, the, the, the ra they're jumping up the ranks uh, fairly quickly. So, I don't know, you got out in 2011, right? Yeah. So, previous to then, you said you definitely had things go things like senior privates and you definitely had people who had set term limits that you had to do per rank. Um, I, I think maybe just because of the, the increased operational deployment of the British Army, and the reduced, reduced numbers that they were facing at the time, that they, they were struggling either for recruiting or to fill positions. And, you know, they were lacking commanders in certain areas. And, like, my whole time in, in my battalion, every platoon I was in was never fully manned. And that's mm. that's a scary thought. Um, it was fully manned on deployments, don't get me wrong, but when we are in the UK, every single, every single day it was never fully manned. Like, the company was never fully manned to what you what you would expect so you maybe had a company which normally has three platoons in it and it's it's only operating at two platoons uh uh two platoons plus i don't know a handful of guys or they'll they'll bring the the company size down to two platoons or whatever and just operate out of them like two bigger platoons but um guys are taking advantage of that now and i took it i was probably one of the 
the earlier guys to take advantage of it. I came off my first deployment and went straight on an NCO cadre. Now that's not too, too, um, too unusual. I then done three, three years as a Lance Corporal and then uh, juniors and then I was on seniors two years later. Now that's not necessarily, necessarily um, extraordinary. It, I would say it's, it's generally at the time it was definitely an average, but I think maybe 10 years ago that would have been almost unheard of pretty much. And nowadays I know for a fact that they're, they're getting guys on NCO carriers six months in battalion with no experience whatsoever, not even a battalion exercise under the belt. And then a year and a half later, two years later, they're on juniors. Um, and that can't be a good thing either. Like coming back to what you were talking about, the TA, they're, they're, they're getting guys promoted every year after doing a two week course. That there is failing them individuals because you're putting them in a position to lead men when they're not ready to, you're putting them, you're putting them there because you need that, per, you need that PID on paper to look filled, regardless if the guy can do the job or not. And then as I was like, as I said, like I, I, I took advantage of it a little bit. I mean, I'm talking like a, a percentage, percentage point. Um, but there's, I know for guys that take that, and especially now when the army's super undermanned, they're fucking firing the boys through promotions. But you, when you do that, you reduce the, the effectiveness because, you, the guys are the guys aren't trained to the capability that, that they need to be, and they they also aren't they also don't have the experience the bank of experience to to lean on. And it really is you know you know yourself that it really does come down to experience that makes the commander or makes the leader. You can do the courses all day long. I never learned anything off my seniors, nothing whatsoever. I learned a bit off of juniors. But it was the experience of working day in, day out with good commanders and being on tour and being on exercises and, you know, training each day in, day out in, in the battalion. That, that's where I learned my, my role. And I go on courses to get qualified. You might learn a bit here or there, but you, you, de you go there to get qualified. Um, so if you've got guys that are stepping up into all these ranks who don't have all that experience of the, the deployments, the training in-house, uh, the, the overseas exercises, for instance, then... Those boys, they cannot be at the same quality that guys in the previous decade are at. Now, don't get me wrong. Being on deployment, it's there's no there's no substitute for an exercise. You know, that's that's no substitute for exercise. There's nothing that compares to being on deployment. The amount of learning that you get there, hour by hour, is invaluable. So that has to take into 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 um it has to come into fruition at some point it's been wholly valuable and that has to come into context in terms of looking at these uh looking at guys if they're ready for promotion or not but yeah two weeks course and then a, an annual fucking weekend away definitely isn't enough and like i said it does come down to the fact that they're they're failing guys and i seen it myself what you what you were talking about there mate is of uh commanders from the ta being in a business position where they're expected to lead but they just can't and I, I wouldn't say it's their fault. Like I've said, it's not their fault. The army's put them in, my, in that position um, without the checks and balances. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy that shit like that's even able to, to slip, for, slip through the net. You know what I mean? But that's just, that's just how the army is. You would think it would be super professional, but it generally, it generally isn't. Yeah, well, the thing is, with the, the, the reason people can get promoted quicker now is because retention's so shit. Yeah. So there's a lot more dead man's shoes to fill. The thing with the TA is... Back in the day where it was like, because now, you know, you've got private soldiers now handling gear and doing operations that were the role of SF 20 years ago, right? You know, like the way, like the, the level of individual training now is far higher than it used to be. Back in the 80s, where the TA was like, you know, like, a, or, or let's say the 70s, 80s, where the TA was this massive force that was basically the idea would be that you can mobilize them, send them over to Germany, and then essentially all you'd be doing is manning a fucking shell scrape. And like, you, you, you didn't need to know that much, you know, like, so a section commander and, and your blokes, you train together all the time, you know each other and then you get deployed as a one -er. That kind of works for that big old school conventional warfare like you get in the Second World War or a career or something. It doesn't work for Afghanistan and Iraq when you work in complex environments. You've got all kinds of kit that you need to be familiar with. Never mind, like, and then you've, you, you know, you're going out on, like, you, you don't, there's no one day that's the same. There's all kinds of different ops. So you need to be good at 
everything. You need to be good at soft app patrolling. You might need to be good at fucking taking down a house. And you just can't do that in that short amount of time. So the TA was outdated and it was shown to be outdated by what was going on there. So you take these sergeants and they've got less, like if they've got less knowledge than a private. And the army being what it is, it's, a, it's an environment of aggressive young men. You put someone in and the lads see that they're struggling, then it's like blood in the water. <laughs> and once that's happened on one thing, then that's it. And then, but also lads aren't stupid. They know that that fucker's getting twice, almost twice the money you are. And then, so there's that resentment starts to come into it. Um, I think going in, like you, you can easily go in as a Lance Jack, TA Lance Jack, and you, you will not struggle because let's be honest, two IC's job is not that fucking hard. Section commander on somewhere like Afghan Iraq, really hard job. Um, and there are like you, you, there are TA guys that can step up to that. But even in the with the best will in the world, like there's just probably not that because the here, here's the kind of like the dilemma. Wait, like you said yourself, you went away for tour, you came back, you did an NCO course. What's happening with most TA lads is when they come back is they then go on to leave and they go back to their civvy job for a bit, or whatever. So you might have in like let's say a, an eight year period, you might have a regular soldier that's done three years, uh, sorry, three tours, and you've got TA soldiers done three tours. But the TA soldiers' experience is all tour, whereas the, t- the soldier has got that plus big exercises. Maybe he's done a Batus. He might have done a Falklands. That's where the difference comes in. Um, so like the TA, like I know TA lads that have done five, six, seven tours. They're fucking privates because they never got time to go and do the NCO carders because when they came back, they were going back to work. Now I know TA, I, there's lads that I joined with now because with 20 years since I joined, which makes me feel fucking ridiculous, 20 years since I joined, they're going on sergeant majors now. They've never done a tour. Yeah. Now that's bonkers to me. Like that to me. And um, like, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but basically the reason I couldn't go back to TA when I got back is, and this is like something I've, I, I've heard for a lot of lads that I've met working on circuit and stuff, is that the, the, the privates and Lance Jacks came back with a lot of experience. You were almost weren't welcome back in the TA because the guy teaching the fucking lessons and stuff is a sergeant, color sergeant, sergeant major, never done a tour, and you've just come back from fucking Operation Panther's Claw, and like you know, it's just every and like you got these young TA lot, like you see the young seventeen year olds that are like, well, hang on, how come he's telling us what to do, and he's the one that's been fighting all the time, and like you, and I think there was like a deliberate thing to like clear everyone out, um, because it just doesn't work. You can't have experience across the bottom in a hierarchical structure. That's not, that's just not how a hierarchy can work. You can't operate that way. It'd be like having your kids, your kids have got all the life experience in the house and you're telling your kids what to do. It just doesn't work. Especially in the British army, um, where, and I'm sure this is the the case throughout the, throughout the world as well, that you, you, you look up to your leaders, regardless of what you might think of them. And you look, well, I don't want to talk for everyone, but generally I would think that guys are looking up to leaders because their leaders have done something that they haven't, or they've, ex- they've got experiences that they haven't, or they've got knowledge that they haven't. So they're looking up to them and almost like a fucking father figure. Like you can teach me something that I don't know. Therefore I benefit. Therefore I grow, you know, it's, it's that, that sort of cycle. Uh, but like you said, if you've got guys down below guys, lower uh, at, at lower ranks who know it all and who have got all the experience and, who have got all the the knowledge to give the 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 hierarchy is redundant. You know what I mean? All they all they're doing is a bit of paperwork here and there. But mm-hmm. yeah, um, how so? How did that tour end up? Then you, you you mentioned that you ended up getting with a a good place. Good and bad. Like I I got looking back on it now, um, because I had like a good Telic ten and I had a good Afghan tour, um, because I had those, I can look back on it and be a bit like, ah, oh, well, you know what. Uh, like, I always say that it was like going to, I felt like I was on a sports team that when I went to the suit, like, so I love American football. So I feel like I went to the Super Bowl, but I never got to get on the pitch. Um, and the thing is, I did get to, I did get in contact and stuff out there, but it was, it was always just like, I was, you know, I went out to a lot of IDs. We had some rounds come over our head and stuff, but, you know, someone like two lanks were in the thick of the fighting and it was, it would have been easier to know that it was going on while I was at home. But the fact was I'm sitting there watching the tracer and the RPGs and we're, we're basically a few tactical bounds away. And you're like, yeah. fuck, I want to be in there. Um, and 
that the frustrating part was just knowing that that couldn't be a thing because it didn't matter how much we pushed our case of like, look, let, can we go to, can we just like, can you, we just go and join them? Can we just like, they need the blokes. Can yeah. we just go and fucking fill in for them? Like, um, and so it was frustrating. And th there was times where we could have caught off, like, cause we did a lot of counter IDF patrols. Um, you know, there was times we had opportunities to intercept IDF teams, but um, the people um, like who were in charge of those patrols, because again, we had some good leaders, some not good ones. And they basically, you could tell that they didn't want to kill people. They didn't want those to happen. So they'd find ways of delaying things so that they, so that it never happened. That was like, it was really frustrating. Um, like there was, a, you know, the IDF was, I got, I came, the closest I came to it was not very close at all because uh, there was one night I got a night off patrol um, and I never take a night off on the, on the later patrols, but on this one, because a lot of the patrols were so fucking boring. I took a, a night off and I had, we were in Corrymex, which is another little port cabin kind of things. And there was a play, you know, I'd sit on the same piece of my place on my bed every night, watch a bit of Simpsons or CSI and drink some Mountain Dew. And uh, I was the only one off from my patrol uh, platoon. And one of the other platoon sergeants came and he said, you got to go home and help us fill sandbags. And I kicked off because I was like, I would not have fucking stayed off. I was supposed to be off. I would not have done that to fill sandbags. So I kicked off. I had a proper, I had a proper Barney about it, but I ended up going to do it because he wasn't a bad bloke. So in the end, it was more like, oh, I don't want to fall out with you. Two minutes later, fucking IDF alarm goes off and uh, my Corrie Met gets hit by a, one, a 107 rocket uh, and big fucking of like a, a huge hole in the wall where I was sitting a couple of minutes before. Um, so sandbag filling saved my life on that one. Okay. Um, but you know, there was that, that was that kind of thing. And, but I, I got a rude awakening there as well. Like one of my good mates, we, we'd like done all the mobilization training and PDT together and stuff like that before I got sent to my place and he went to his place. He went with the Yorks and, um, there was two lads with the Yorks I knew and I got a letter off, you know, I got an EB off one of them. And um, I read it and he was like, oh, yeah, by the way, Chris has lost his leg. I was like, fuck. Because I, I didn't even have like fucking packs on my first tour, the accident insurance. So I was yeah. like, oh, nothing will happen to me. But that that kind of brought it on because I was like, fucking hell, Chris has lost his leg. Um, and that, that so that kind of changed my attitude on things. And when I look back on it now, I got a lot of a good experience on that tour because I proved myself. I like to think I proved myself as a good bloke and competent. I ended up getting quite a lot of jobs. Like, um, so I did the ATO, I did Wiz. Um, so like whiz whiz, we'd go out on the ATO calls, but you'd be at the back of the convoy. And I had like a lot of responsibility as a 23 year old Lance Jack. So I'd have my team and then I'd be with the whiz and they're, they're not babies. They're not there to babysit you. They're doing their own jobs. Yeah. And there was some, some days I got put back in the ATO because the, um, the guy that was the team commander, he went down with DMV. So they put me back in there and we're talking my first month on tour, first month in Iraq. When you're the force protection one, you're the ones that plan the route and lead the route out to an IED. So they'd be like, right, there's, there's this fucking, there's an IED out at such and such. And I'm like, holy fuck. So I've got my map out in my shaking hands. And I'm like trying to brief, <laughs> trying to brief the A2 on the route. And then we're leading the front. I'm like, you know, I'm leading the A2 convoy. Yeah. So there was some experiences like that. When I look back on it now, it was a lot better to have that without not having 20 RPGs coming in at me at the same time. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, those, those type of situations where you, because I mean, this is, it's fucking war. It happens. You get thrown at the deep end. You have to fucking deal with it. But those experiences, mate, they're so valuable for for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. And I'm sure that I'm sure for for a fucking fact that you lean on these things and you think, right, if life's tough now, let me just think back to fucking 2008, 2007, or whenever. Mm -hmm. Like what I was doing at that age, like this is absolutely nothing in comparison. You know what I mean? You're responsible for what 20, 30 guys' lives. If you pick the wrong route, that you're all gonna get fucking waxed. Um, you know what's funny about it though, mate, is like there's so much like you know those experiences you have in life that's such a powerful, intense experience. You very, you vaguely, you hardly remember it. That's what those shouts were like for me. Like yeah. I can tell you no detail. I know it happened, and I can remember it being told. Right, this is what we're doing, and then everything else is a blur because I was so fucking just filled with adrenaline for the entire thing that I can barely remember like any of the rest of it. My whole fucking, my whole Herrick 10 is like that. I can't remember fuck all, nothing. And it was the craziest time in the whole conflict. It was the craziest time the British Army's had since the Falklands, that, that 2009 summer period. And I can't remember any of it. Were you so, Blackwatch, really? Yeah. I, um, 
so when I went back to when I went back my second tour, I took a journal, but we'll we'll get to that later when when you when we're in Afghan uh, Afghan, but um, yeah, so that that tour was fucking pretty boring. But then you were on Helic Herrick Telic uh, Ten, did you say? Yeah, so basically, I was like, I ain't fucking done it. I'm like, I'm, I can't go back after this. So I applied for, um, I basically, because they, they were like the pairing regiments of the TA, you know, I was World Welsh TA. And this is where, again, the, the army comes in. So I've been on the ground for six months in, in Iraq. I've worked with ATO. I've done all these jobs. I know the routes. Uh, and I'm staying on with the new battalion coming in. So you'd think the best thing to do would be leave me there so I can start. No, nope. the army in its wisdom, you've got to go back and redo your mats and you've got to do redo, <laughs> you've got to redo PDT. So even though I did back to back, they sent me back for a PDT, an Afghan one, by the way. So they sent me to Afghan PDT so that I could go back to Iraq where I'd just been. By the time I got there, I'd lost all my acclimatization. I'd lost my feel for the ground because it was about it's about five weeks. So I had a five week break in the middle yeah. where I was doing where I was down in fucking um, Lyndon Hyde and fucking doing my maths in fucking Nottingham. Like the army is is bonkers. Like anyone that's not been in it, there's no you can't make sense of no sense. Like they just do, and so that was frustrating because while I was out there, massive contacts were happening. I think the I think Volvo's lost five blokes before I even got back out there. So. Then, not only am I joining a new unit, but I'm joining a new unit who have just been going through these massive contacts and stuff together, and I'm coming in now as an outsider. So I'd like to say good job, Army, on that one. Fucking mince. That, that's what that's goes on it, in their head. That's how, it is. that's how it is. They, they just, they, you know, they love to tick boxes. They f- that's all it is for them as well. Covering yeah. their arse, fill the position. That's it. That's as, as simple as it gets. Um we ended up, so you were talking earlier about being under strength. We were so under strength in, in Fatalic 10. It was ridiculous. Like, so we had a bunch of TA people making up the numbers. Uh, we also had a bunch of Blackwatch making up the numbers. So um, like my, we, we called, so I was in the lead vehicle for, for our platoon, and we basically called it the disposables because it was like the driver was TA. Then we had, a, we had the platoon commander up there and then the gunner. They were both regulars. And then in the back was me and a bunch of Blackwatch guys. <laughs> So it was like it was like right. Well, they're doing this so that if we get fucking schwacked, then it's going to be it's not going to be taking anybody off the battalion or that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I had uh, two two guys who trying to think uh, trying to think their names. Davy was one of them. I know that doesn't narrow it down. And the other lad was um, oh god, a ginger fuck, guy, David Taylor. No, nah, it nah, wasn't. He wasn't ginger. He was um, ah oh, fucking hell. I'll, I'll I'll remember it later. It's one of it's a weird name and. Uh, um, I'll have to have a look in my, in my diary. But we had a few lads. We had, uh, uh, what was that little lad called? He was like the youngest dad in Britain at one point. The youngest lad. dad? He was, the young, he was the youngest dad in Britain or something. He had a kid at like 13. Oh, he, was with us. He, he was a good lad from Blackwatch. There was a few good lads there. And I know they. I, I know definitely some of them were in Afghan because I ran into them. In, um, but it's mad, mate, because it's like you go through this experience with these people. You just forget people's names and stuff. Yeah. Like I tell you, I could recognize them straight away, but... Um, but uh, Cole, uh, Cole was the other one actually Cole um, I'll have to look up their names for you mate see if you know them but yeah that was my teammate um, I had a couple of black watches I mean sw- we swapped around a bit but we only had enough blokes to put two people in the back of every warrior apart from the front, uh, front wagon we had four but it was one of those they, they assumed that I'd been with two lanks that they took over from so when I got there it was good in a way because they were like oh this guy must be mental because he's come back <laughs> so that, that that was like that was a helpful bit about it because they all thought I was this like nuts war junkie which I suppose I was in a way but the other bit was like they'd assumed that I'd been in the city in Warriors all tour so they're like right you can go in the lead warrior I'm like yeah no dramas I get the back of the warrior I'm like how the fuck do you open this door <laughs> but, and, so I was just like so um, it was just uh, it, it, it was a it, it was in 2006 as well I still think the army was in the um 2007, sorry, the army was still a bit in the old rule of the fist kind of days. So, like looking back on it now, the color sergeant definitely tried to, like the CQMS tried to fuck me over when I got there because uh, actually it's pretty funny. So, like I said, they sent me away. I get there in the middle of the night. You know, you do the old case sound landing and everything in the hook. Um, 
And um, I, I, I go to the CQMS and he gives me a platoon, gives me a tent to go to. And he's like, oh, the lads aren't on a strike op tonight. Because they'd be going out like every night. So he's like, don't wake them up because the lads would be fucked because the temp op tempo was so high. So I sneak in there, put my stuff in a pit, you know, because everything was undercover. It was all, um, everything was sandbagged up and stuff. I finally fucking crawling into my pit. Fucking ideal, IDF alarm goes off. Bunch of rockets come in. One of them lands really close. And um, one of the guys is like, fucking hell, am I crazy? Is that you? It's like, guess. And we, so we're fucking one of the other TA, TA lads. So, um, you just recognized his voice. Yeah, I recognized his voice. We ended up <laughs> just imagine that, like you're in an IDF know, attack yeah. and then someone you haven't seen for seven months just pops up <laughs> in the ring. But um, the next day then, I go to the CQMS to get, my, to get my rifle and everything. And he's like, and you know, bear in mind, this is the first lie in the lads have had for days. He's like, go and wake everyone up and get them on areas. I was like, you can't. So I'm like, hi, I'm the new Lance Jack. Uh, get up and go do fucking areas. So that nearly resulted in the fight on the first day. Um, but it was very much like it was, that tour was, a, was like, you did have to take people around the back of the HESCO. It was that kind of tour, which I don't, yeah. I didn't really see. I didn't really see that in Afghan and stuff. Um, but like, I think of that, there was still, because that battalion there was still the remnants of the battalion that had been based in Germany and stuff and was more like what I call old school army. Yeah. So it was like, you know, it, it was still like that kind of behavior. Like, you know, it's like, right, one of the lads has gobbing off, right, get behind the fucking Esco. There's no our guy in and stuff going I'll on. I'll tell you, so you said that was 2007. Yeah, 2007. Two, two years later in Afghan, it was the exact same. There was <laughs> nothing had changed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's definitely not the case now. You you seriously cannot do an absolute thing, um, and you know it's a good thing and a bad thing. Like I don't I don't condone violence, um, but fucking guys can literally just pull the book on on an end literally end guys' careers and and on an accusation. And I've seen it happen. Guys, one of the boys went to Coley um, on an accusation. It was, it's, you know, it's just fucking ridiculous. It's not the environment you want to be in. It's, it's an environment for alpha males. Fights are going to happen, especially if you're disrespecting someone who is clearly, clearly, you know, just a different level from you or even just got so much experience or so much admiration from other SD guys. Like, you cannot in this environment of alpha males fucking shit on someone else and get away with it or walk all, all over someone else and get away with it or or try and fucking make the other make someone look like a cunt in front of a bunch of guys and get away with it because then if that happens and this is probably probably the, the start of the downfall of the army as i see it and it's bear in mind this is my own personal opinion let's say you've got a guy let's say a platoon sergeant who's been in there 12 13 years and you get a young guy come in he's been in there six fucking weeks right that guy giving the fucking platoon sergeant talk uh, like cheek or fucking uh, back chat in your day and my fucking my early day, I would say would never ever ever fucking stand. I I witnessed it in my later years and I couldn't fucking believe it. That's it just undermines it just undermines the rank structure and the the you know the chain of command so much that other people start to question as well. And you cannot have that in this type of environment, of especially with, with alpha males that they fucking need. You know, their job is to close with and kill the fucking enemy, and you can't have people back chatting the fucking leaders of these men. It 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 just can't happen. But anyway, I don't want to talk on that. I fucking I hate talking about that sort of shit. But well, what what, so, what I would just add to that, what I what I do just want to add to that though, mate, is that like what 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 like it's not. In a, in, a, in the way that I've always seen it is if someone back chatted the sergeant, that's not the sergeant that then needs to get aggressive. That's going to be then a lance jack or a screw that's going oh, to take yeah, care yeah. of it. Yeah, of you know, you've that, got because it's and like, that, and, and I think that's I think that's important for people to realize as well. It's not that the sergeant comes down on you, police your, 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 your own kind of you know, guys. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So, like, the, re the reaction to that would have been something like that, like a lance jack, another private, a screw, yeah. fucking filling the guy in. And then out of that comes a complaint to Sergeant Major. The Sergeant Major has a, a, a or or whoever the padre, they have a, a legal duty of care to fucking report it and you know go through the the, the legal process. And bro, it's, it, it, that this shit is killing the army. There's a million things that's killing the army, but this this is one of them as well. But we'll just fucking skip that sort of shit. <laughs> but um, so you you are armored then in in Telic Ten, and uh, were yeah. you armored in the first two as well? 
No, I first saw her in the fucking snatches. Jesus. Uh, right. Yeah. Let, let's go back to snatches and then and then we'll talk about armored. But because obviously there's a massive, massive uh public interest, or at the time there was a lot of public interest in the, about sending troops to war in fucking vehicles that were designed for public order in the UK. Um what were some of the things that you personally experienced or you, you witnessed or were happening at that time in, in these vehicles? And let me just say, well, for it wasn't what? just the UK, it was, it, was, it was nationwide, it was worldwide, international, that guys in Iraq were under-equipped under with, um, with the right tooling and the right vehicles and stuff like that. But what were some of the things that you've seen? Well, for one thing, they're just old. So they break down all the time. So there was very, like we used to go out and free vehicle patrols it'd be very rare where you come back in and one of the vehicles is not getting towed. Like, it just, they'd break down. And it wasn't, our mechanics worked their fucking bollocks off on them. And our drivers worked their bollocks off. But it's just old. Like, we're talking like, some of these fucking things are like, probably from like, fucking, they were older than the blokes. <laughs> and they break down. And then, um, with, there was a winter tour as well. And like, Iraq, in the winter, Iraq gets wet. And it's, and it's sand. So what happens when you get wet sand? So your vehicles fucking bog in. Um, my mate was on a, he was on a three vehicle patrol with snatch that got hit by a daisy chain IED and it basically turned two of them inside out. It just like fucking, uh, there was a lad died pretty much everybody else in the two vehicles lost an arm or lost a leg. Um, they were, it, you might as well have been driving around in Papier Mache. Um, you were not allowed to go to the city of Basra. You were not allowed in the city in a snatch because it was just too high risk. Um, so we used them to patrol the roads um, but if, if an EFP hit you, you were done. Um, you know, we were very lucky that the EFPs, the only ones that hit our company were detonated. There was a, an infrared cause they were using these, um, like basically like what a burglar alarm is. They were using those to set them off. So you had these infrared boxes on top of the front of the front snatch. And that would like send out basically like a pulse. And it would it meant that the IED went off just in front of the vehicle. So it would go across the front. The problem is with that, they get wise to that. So then they set the charge back from the, where the thing is. Um, but yeah, like bear in mind, the EFPs were taking out warriors and challenger tanks to send people around in a snatch was criminal. Like we should have been, I, I got no dramas going on foot, mm -hmm. but they want a certain area covered. So you get sent out in a snatch. Uh, and it was only good. Like the fact was we were lucky that we didn't hit IDs because if you hit one, you're done. Like as simple as that. Um, and you, you know, you're whizzing along, you're in top cover and you're supposed to be looking for an IED. Fuck off. As if, as if, <laughs> you know, you just, it's, not, uh, you, it's you, not as if they, they present themselves easily to, to you, you know, they're, they're camouflaged in there. They, they're <clears throat> essentially to the level where they, they just look like a regular curb at some points or just a regular mm -hmm. bag of, bag of rubbish. Um, and there's rubbish everywhere. It's the whole side of the road is rubbish. And every time you go around the corner, you start praying to God because it feels like it's going to tip over. Uh, they just were not, they were not fit for purpose. It's as simple as that. They were not fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, I had a mate who I was on juniors with, uh, from the Royal Welsh as well. And he, he was telling me, um, um, a few stories, some guys in the, in the Royal Welsh getting hit with RPGs and, and snatches and the way that the RPG hits, it, it's almost like on a, it's not a direct impact. So it, it won't explode the second the millisecond that it hits it will hit the uh, the target or hit the the object and have like a half second delay by that time it's went inside the 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 side of the snatch and then it, it, it detonates in the inside listen if i'm talking complete bullshit you can leave a comment down below but <laughs> the way i see it that's how it, that's how it goes either that or there's some sort of science that happens afterwards that just pulverizes everything inside in that inside that uh, compartment of w where the chips would be but he was telling me that some of the things that he's seen and witnessed was just in incredible because uh they just never had the protection and uh and you can you might be able to talk on this as well but bar armor came later on as well as a as a a neutralizer to the the threat of things like rpgs and these we had bar armor on the warriors yeah we had bar I, I, yeah yeah, I like so the thing I've heard about I have heard about RPGs going through one side of the snatch and out the other. Hmm. Um like that's how that's how thin they were. Um you know, like I just I I didn't feel safe in them ever. You knew if you got hit you were gonna be smoked. Um hmm. to be fair, in the back of a warrior I felt reasonably safe. Um but at the same time, because we had bar armor for RPGs, 
Um, and then you got the Chobham armor on there, which, and it, they could like, you know, so I have a friend, I have a few friends, well, um, who have been hit by 20 or more IEDs, most of those in Iraq. Um, and because like you, so like some of the lads would get schwacked by like a few RP, a few IEDs on the same night in Iraq. Yeah. You know, that's, that's how much it was. Um, I, 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 can't, I don't want to, um, I can't remember the exact numbers by now, but you're talking about like over 20 in an op of like hitting IEDs, 20 in an op. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I did feel reasonably safe. That being said, one of our missions in Iraq was, was to drive around until we got hit by an IED so that iStar could then track them back and launch a strike off. Yeah. So I can't say that I enjoyed sitting in the lead vehicle, driving through the middle of Basra, just waiting to get hit by an IED. That was not fun. It's fucking crazy. Some of the, some of the things they get you to do. Um, what yeah, was, it was I, great money. Oh, oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to someone recently and I, I was like, I cannot, be listen, I never joined the army for money, but I can't believe how little they paid us. Honestly, yeah. I was 18 in 2009 and I was clearing 1100 pound on tour as a private soldier. It's, it's, it's fucking criminal. I'd but, have done it for free though, mate, honestly. Yeah, oh my days. You could send me back today, back to Herrick 10 and I'd fucking, I'd do it for free. Um, it was the, the best, best time of my life. And you know, I've, I've talked to, to other people as well about why that might be, but it's just primal. Like, that's what that's what it comes down to. Um, and I think nature takes takes over and, and your releases the amount of fucking dopamine in your brain that just it just is is optimal. That's, I don't know. There's just this optimal sort of um, for you or me. Oper- no, not not for everyone though. For everyone, mate, it would be the worst possible experience. I believe some people are born into different. Yeah, it's a different. Yeah. Like, I, I believe like you got like the same as you got an ant colony. I think you and me were born to do that stuff, so it feels optimal to us. I mean, that's a great way of putting it. Like, yeah. like literally, we were living. You know where people say I'm living my best life. We literally, we're living our best life. That's what yeah. we were put. We were put on the planet to do that. Well, uh, for other people, it'd be fucking horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I like those guys in my platoon. Don't, don't get me wrong, but um, <laughs> um, let me just ask you this question: You could answer as honestly or or as dishonest if you want, but how often does your, how often does your time at war come into your mind? Is it weekly, is it monthly or daily basis? Every day. Daily, mate. Daily. It, it's mad because I, I listen, I'm, I'm not, I know for a fact I'm not alone in this and I'm, no, you've just confirmed it, but I know I'm not alone in the fact that I have these, the thoughts of my time in, on deployment and it is an everyday a reminder now that it's been coming up 10 well it's been 10 years since my first deployment more so now than ever now that i'm not part of that environment anymore it's it's almost and now i'm doing the podcast as well so um it's almost second nature but um yeah it's it's a it's something that lives with me every single day in my life and that's not a a negative thing that's not something i dwell on it's not something that i i'm 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 uh I'm under any weight of it's it's a privilege to remain re- remember that shit every day. Um, well, it is, is listen sorry, for me. I was so so privileged to have been able to do that at the time. I got super lucky about getting on on that specific deployment. Um, I got I was part of the biggest av- aviation assault since fucking World War Two on on Panchai Palang. I was in the craziest time of fucking of uh, war fighting in Afghanistan. I just talked to Jason Gardner. He was in, he was operating at Kandahar at the same time, 2009. He said the exact same thing. 2009 was the craziest time he'd had a war. And anyone that was lucky enough, because it is luck, it doesn't matter how good you are. You have to be lucky enough to get on the right tour. Anyone who's lucky enough to be there will only will understand that. And it is a privilege to have served my country. And I was lucky. Um and I just fucking, it comes into my mind every single day, just about, I don't know, fucking everything from seeing how, how impoverished kids are on the other side of the world to how fucking the British army does, does war. It, um, it's fucking crazy. Understanding the fucking true might of the American military for fuck's sake. I think I, op- I, I think I flew on two British helicopters in 2009 bearing in mind our role was fucking aviation assault and i was there for six months 
We flew on two British helicopters. I flew personally on two British helicopters. Everything else is supplemented by the US Marine Corps, mm-hmm. which is bigger than the British Army. And the, <laughs> the, 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 the Army, the US Army and the fucking the US Air Force. We, we, had to, we had to lean on them to, to have our operational capability uh, be effective. It's just fucking... So I, got, I, got, I got told by a podcast guest recently, mate, that... Because I, I, that's always one of, I, one, of, one of the things I thought. It's like, I've spent 18 months of my life on tour, but I think about it more than anything else. And he explained it like this. He was like, but you actually did more living. So, like, actually being present and living, you did way more in that six months than you'd usually do in six years. So in terms of experience and like feelings and everything, like, yeah, like it's technically a shorter amount of time, but when you actually look at what happened, it's, it's like you lived more in yeah. a short amount of time. So rather than measuring stuff by how long we've been somewhere, it's probably better to measure it by how much we did. Um, but you no, know, mate, like you said something I think is dead on was that we are so lucky to have landed on those times. Like, I didn't get to do as much as I wanted to in Iraq, I'll be honest. And there's, there's things in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan I feel like I missed out on too. But for me to be able to land in Iraq in 2007 and Afghan in 2009, fuck me, I'm lucky as fuck to have that happen to me. So lucky. That's the height, isn't it? On both both yeah, years. Um, let me just ask, were you, <clears throat> were you single at the time and, and, or did you have a house or did you have any commitments back home when you were deployed? Um, I still don't really have any commitments <laughs> to be quite honest I'm in my mum's house right now I don't really believe in commitments in that sense um, my commitment quite honestly is to myself yeah. um, and that means travel and that means life and that means living um, I had a lot of my, well, actually it's quite interesting because it's definitely war that's given me this mentality because When I went to Iraq, my plan was to buy houses and flip houses when I got back. And obviously I did the back-to-back tours and it's not a lot of money on those tours, but you know what? It doesn't cost a lot of money to buy a house in Rex and Mieber. So by the time I got back, um, with the market being what it was back then, I probably could have bought two houses and got two houses on the go. Instead, I went up to visit a uni mate of mine who was still at uni and I came back about two months later and I had no money. (laughs) Um, But... That I think I can definitely look at Iraq as the point where my mentality changed towards money and um, towards life. Like I, I um, after Iraq, I should put this in actually. Um, basically, I look. I came back from Iraq and um, because I was doing because I'd gone in the back door through TA, I was back. You know, back at TA, I wasn't with a regular battalion after Iraq, so I applied for the police. And because I was a Welsh speaker, I got fast tracked, and I went and did my tests, and I got a, I got a start date. Uh, and I was working in the gym at the time. And um, I saw some footage of a warrior driving through a compound wall in Afghanistan. I was like, I want to be a fucking cop, but I want to go to fucking war again. So I did. Uh, I told a lie to my family. I told them the police are not taking anyone in. And I was like, oh, by the way, I'm going to Afghan. Um, and uh, my mum, when we found that out when I told her last year, and she was she's still, she's still mad about it, even though I did come home in one piece. But um, it was just... it. Um, you know, the whole, the whole commitment thing, mate, you know, to bring it back to the question of it is like my commitment is to live in a life of experiences. And I don't think my life experience is going to benefit from having a mortgage. Just don't, Yeah. you know, um, like I'm in a lucky position to be able to do that. Cause my mum puts up with me when I want to come home and then I fuck off to America for a few months. Um, but like, I just, I look at things and go like, like, I, you know, obviously, you know, it's not, we're not, I'm not exactly coming up with any philosophical revelations here, but when you go to war, you realize you can die and you, you know, and that is a, a real gift because I don't, I really don't think that most people, 2020 is probably the first year, to be honest, people have flapped too much about it, but 2020 people, a lot of people our age for the first time have gone, oh my God, I might die. And it's like, well, we figured that out 23 years old or whatever it was, you know, yeah. and it's like, that's really that's really powerful because when you figure that out, then you're like, well, you know, fuck, I, I do. As far as I know, I only get one go at this thing, and um, yeah, so no to girlfriend and no to a <laughs> and no to a house. Well, the reason I asked is because um, at the time, 
this is only in hindsight looking back that I can reflect on this and understand it. But <clears throat> at the time, I had no commitments. I was young. I never had a house. I never had a girl, uh, like a serious girlfriend or anything that I had back here to to think about or a wife or house or anything to think about. I never had any bills to pay, nothing. So I was over there and I was, I had nothing to think about other than being present, like you mentioned earlier on. And that was for both my tours to uh, to Afghan. And um, I think coming back from Afghan, I thought, right, now I've got this money. Now I need to be sensible and make sure I set myself up in in, in a perfect position to to be successful in life. And it, like I mentioned, in hindsight, it is what I it, now I understand it. What I was doing was trying to make other people think that I was successful. I'd been this fucking this guy who's mm. been to war a couple of times. Now he come back and set yourself up for life. Whereas in my mind, I knew that I wanted that. But I knew that that wasn't my, you know, my calling, so to speak. Um, I just, I, I was all, I'm very adventurous like yourself. Like I'm always traveling. I'm always doing things differently. And when I, when I, when I set myself down and got myself um, fucking screwed into that house and screwed into that relationship, when I go back, it fucking ruined me, bro. It ruined me. And I wanted nothing of it. Um, and eventually it was hard, but eventually I had to come to terms of, fucking getting rid of the house and put it on airbnb and i got rid of the girlfriend at the time but and and that was tough as well because like i did really enjoy being with that girl but i just didn't love her anymore i had to put myself first i had to live my life for what i was doing um and that come that that was only i was only able to realize that when i looked back on my time at war i was content i was 100 percent happy then ever yeah. since then i've not been and the reason that that was the case is because I was living for other people. Now I'm fucking super happy. I'm living for myself. I've got a fantastic wife and she's, uh, she's American. Um, we just sold our house over there. And, um, and listen, this year has been shit, but it is complete. It is absolutely nothing on what I've went through in my life. And I've had an easy life. I've not had a hard life like some fucker in Africa. You know what I mean? um it's, that's it's, that's the thing about those africans though mate it's like people over here now are like in all flap stations about covid and stuff but like people are like oh it must be awful in africa from right now it's like this isn't even their top five priorities over there <laughs> like they because they go they're like they have that all the time but mate you're right and, and look i keep saying this all the time and i'm going to keep fucking banging on about it because i think it's important and that is most veteran issues are not caused by PTSD or anything like that. You know, they are caused a lot of times about just being unhappy. Yes. Just being miserable. And, and like, and, and so many people, they come back, like, because here's the thing. If you are the kind of person who, who thought that it was a good idea to join the army, and then you were the kind of person that enjoyed your time at war, why would you then all of a sudden become somebody that wants to just have a normal life? You've never been normal all your life before. Why would you certainly be? Now, there's some people that join the army and, and probably were like, oh, actually, I, this was a mistake. I want a normal life. Yeah. So I'll, many... I'll, I'll ju jump in and I'll tell you why well, yeah, it is in hindsight. That's because that's what I've been told makes you successful. Exactly. You need to have a house. Exactly. You need to have a decent car. You need to have a wife. That's what makes you successful. When you're successful, people look, at you, look, look on you with higher esteem. Now I know that that is complete and utter fucking bullshit. When I, when, I ever, when I do have kids and when I bring them up and teach them what success is, success is being happy, success is being content at what you're doing, success is having something that you enjoy and you put your, your time and devote, devote your, your efforts to that, that, has an out, that provides something as an outcome. It might be a physical outcome, it might be a, a professional outcome, it might be an emotional outcome to somebody else, but that for me is what success is now. Now I understand it. And listen, you only get that through growth, bro. You only get that through mista yep. making mistakes. Well, here's the thing, mate, right? Here's the thing. You and I didn't have podcasts growing up. Like, because the thing is, my mum and dad probably did try and tell me this stuff, but you don't listen to your mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> like you just you just don't there's i think there's something biological in us that makes us not because nobody does it the world over right but like you know so going back to just the whole when i was first trying to get mobilized i had no information from no one about it you just didn't like now 
there's so much fucking information out there. The fact that like someone can listen to your podcast or can listen to mine or can like, like there's so much information that there's no need for someone now to go through what you did or what I did. Cause I, I, me, I've had some downs too. Like I'm not saying it ain't been all fucking bed roses, but you don't need to go through it now because there's like, cause they're not just going to hear you say it. They're going to hear me say it. And they're going to hear a hundred other people say it. And then, cause like you said, it's like when you're in the military, you look up to people, you know, you look up to your platoon sergeants and stuff, but let's be honest, they weren't really taking you on their knee and giving you the advice because they're, you're not in their peer group and it doesn't work like that really. Yeah. But now you've got like, there's, there's all these, all these people putting their information out there. So for a soldier now, when he gets out, he can learn from like all these other, all the people like yourself putting it out there. So I think what well, something that I think is really fucking really awesome going forward is that like, there's a gap in most of our lives where we made mistakes um, because we were told something like you were saying, you got told that this is the way to do it. Some people never get out of that. Like, and that's the sad thing, mate, is that you've got out of it. I got out of it. You know, you and I both realized, hang on, nah, this is it. But a lot of people don't get out of that. And I think that is tragic. But I think, you know, like what you've got going on with the podcast here, um, this is the kind of stuff that will hopefully stop people falling into those, those traps and, and then being miserable for the rest of their life. Like what people always say, like, and this is like maybe a controversial opinion, but when people talk about the lads that died on tour, and they feel sorry for them. I'm like, don't feel sorry for them. They would literally, like, and I'm, I'm not going to say it's a high point of your life being at war, but it's certainly one of them. Yeah. So it's like, if that's the point where you die, like, most of us are going to die shitting ourselves in a bed is probably how we're going to go out. Yeah. Now, would it be great if they were around? Would it be a great if there was no fucking misery for their families and stuff? Absolutely, because it's the families that suffer realistically is the boys don't suffer once it's done it's done but the families have to live with that forever and it wasn't a high point for the family it wasn't a high point for a mum to have her son go to war that was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to her Thanks but for me. the actual for the actual blokes i gotta be honest mate if i'd have died on tour like I, I i remember even saying to my brother if i die i don't want no fuss being made saying the government sent him and did that i want to be here i want to be doing this this is where I tried to do, uh, when I was in Iraq, I did the back-to-back tours. I tried to stay on for a third. They wouldn't let me. When I was in Afghan, I tried to stay on for a back-to-back tour. They wouldn't let me. I would have stayed on ops constantly if I was allowed to. Yeah. And I'm not the only one. I, I would have just I'm done summer one. tours. Yeah, I, mate, I'd have done the fucking winter <laughs> ones too. Fuck it. But I just, I know, but I know I'm not the only one. I know there's plenty of us who would have just said, and here's, here's my thing, right? While I'm on this little rant, here's my thing. Just I would have rain in a minute. Yeah, I would have loved for the army to just say, who wants to be an Afghan? Raise your hands. Us. Right. We've got 20 blokes from the Black Watch. We've got 20 blokes from the Royal Welsh. We've got 20. We're going to stick you lot in the Afghan battalion and you're staying in Afghan until the job gets done. Sound. If you want to leave. Who wants to go singing? All the rifles yeah. boys stick the front hands up. Fucking hell. But mate, I, there would have been, to me, this I, the rotation thing was a load of bollocks. It should have been, who wants to go there and stay there until this is done? I do. I'll fucking go. Uh, and I'm sure there would have been a lot of blokes who'd been up for that. Listen, I, uh, like you said, this might, say, miss, this might be a little bit controversial. <clears throat> and uh, I've definitely thought about it, not recently, but in, in the past. If I'd have died on tour, regardless of poli- poli- politics or regardless of fucking what the, the wars meant, I was there for a fucking reason. And it was for my country. And it was so the boys next next to me, left and right. And that sounds a little bit cringy. And it, it sounds very un-British to talk like that. But it's the fucking truth. Um, if I'd have been fucking dragged through with Royal Wooden Bassett in a fucking hearse and a coffin and then given a, a full military, military funeral, for me, that's the biggest honour that I could ever have achieved in my life. I'll never, I'll never achieve that honor because for me, that's that's the highest honor that a person can get, being a UK citizen or a British citizen. So I would like me personally, like I said, no commitments, nothing. Would it have been shit for my mum? A hundred percent. But would I have been content with it? Again, a hundred percent. No worries. I'm fucking dead anyway. What does it matter? Yeah. Uh, and then my- you and you're here and you're a hero forever. Yeah, exactly. Forever. Yeah, my name lives like, forever. You can more, do but... you can do no wrong. You can but literally do no wrong. No one knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's 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 it, mate. And like, look, like my brother even said to me once. Me and my brother, we had like a deep sesh one night, 
and I was, and uh, he basically said to me, he was like, I don't, because I was like, oh, I didn't do enough. I didn't do this. I should have done this. I should have done that. And he goes, you wouldn't have been happy unless you died. Like you wouldn't feel you know, like it was basically like you wouldn't not happy. So you wouldn't have felt like you'd done enough unless you died. And I was like, fuck, kind of got a good point there. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and, but that's not just me. That's like, that's a lot of us in general. Like that's a, a, how a lot of us think. Yeah, no, I'm not glorifying being being killed or or or, di- or dying, but if that were to happen, would I be completely fine with it and completely tent? A hundred percent. Nobody wants to fucking die. That's the most stupid sentence or phrase in the world. I want to die for my country. No one wants to do that. But if they happen to die in the fight for their country, fantastic. Their fucking name lives forever more. But anyway, let's get to Afghan. Um, what was your uh, what was the situation there, and what was your your role that you that you had? So, like I said, mate, I was supposed to join the police. Sort of worried, drive through a wall on the news. I was like, I'm going to go to Afghan again. Army being the army. By the time that I actually got to the battalion, the the, the company that I was supposed to go out with had already been out there for four months. So they're like, look, we can send you out now. Or we can fucking just like hold you back for the next company. Because we were just having, there was only one armored company out in Afghan at the time. So Charlie Company were out there. And, um, they, they, and it straddled the tours. So we went out. I went out in um, July 2009. Um, and it was, it was mad because it was like one of my mates was killed with the Welsh Guard. So I literally went to his funeral in the morning and then flew out in the afternoon. Um, and then like we talk about, you know, and obviously a bit longer in the tooth at this point. And I was watching my mate's funeral. I was watching my mate's mum at the funeral, and I was like, "Fucking hell, what am I doing?" Like, because again, it wasn't the worry about dying myself, but it was like looking at a mum and going like, "I could." Because the thing is, mate, going out to Afghan, like, you know the score in two thousand and nine. You know that you're not coming. Like, you know the company is not coming home in one piece. There's absolutely no chance the company is coming home in one piece. Like, we were. I was expecting four or five blokes to die in that company. Um, and that, you know, that, that was how we, I felt going into it because running in the, in the months leading up to it, you know, there was somebody that I knew every month, the three months leading up to it. And uh, someone that I knew every month died. And I was like, Oh fuck, this is just going, this is how 2009 is going to be. Someone that I know every month is going to die. Um, and, and I expected to lose one of my good mates there. I thought that would, I thought that would be quite likely because at the end of the day, I thought one of us, like we had, we had a very good group. We were, so I, would, I was in recce platoon. Um, well, I wasn't technically recce at that time, but I got put into the recce platoon that made up the third platoon. And um, I thought, well, our, our group of junior NCOs, chances are one of us isn't coming back or one of us isn't coming back. With, and and like, as that tour turned out, I got really lucky because one of my really good mates, he broke his, he got blown up and broke his back and like he was critical, but he pulled through. Uh, and another of my best mates got shot through the neck and he pulled through. Those two guys pulling through could have, like, literally we're talking millimeters in another direction. Like, one of, the fir- one of our first couple of weeks on tour, one of my best mates could have been dead. And then one of another ones a couple later. So I, I feel very lucky in that tour that I ended up like they came, they came through. But it was a punchy tour, mate. You know what it was like there. You know, we, when we left Bastion to drive to Musakala, um, my wagon got blown up. Basically, we'd been on the ground for, I think it was our third day. My wagon got blown up. Um, I ended up losing my driver. Um, I thought I'd done enough to keep him. Uh, like he, I, he wasn't breathing when I got to him. And then um, I got him breathing and stuff again. And we put him on the Mert and he was in a mess. But um, I, he was a cat A. But I thought he'd pull through. Um, but we got the news that he died in hospital in, in Sally Oak. So that was hard. Um, and... Then, you know, yeah, my mate got shot through the neck a few, like, not long later. And I thought, fuck, this is just got, this is how it's going to be. Yeah. And it was, you, you know yourself, it was that, it was mad. Because at the time, it was just like a numb kind of acceptance to it. Yeah. Because, um, like, one part of me was glad in a way that I got blown up early. Because I was like, right, well, you didn't freeze. You went, you, it was the first time I'd ever... I, you know, I'd been around kind of like stuff before, but it was the first time I'd ever had to deal with like a, a pretty like, you know, horrific injuries and stuff. Um, and I thought, well, you did it. You, you did it. And, and, and I'm not going to lie, mate. It was in one moment where it's, it's, it sounds bad saying it now because he did die in the end. But at the time we thought he'd say, we thought, you have to remember, we thought we'd saved his life. Mm-hmm. 
So the feeling afterwards of knowing that we we thought we'd saved one of the boys, and then we're going around like fucking patting each other on the back, nothing like hugging or nothing, but just like that hand on the shoulder, like hey, you know that look, and you're just like fucking well done today. And I could have been more proud of my team, um, because where it happened as well, we were told because that that was a day we weren't getting out the back of the Warriors because we got told. If you get if we get ID like this is Taliban country, do not get out of the vehicles because they will spank us. Yeah. But my team like my team followed me out the back of the vehicle. We were on the warrior dealing with him, and I thought any moment, I thought any moment they're gonna fucking light us up. But everyone everyone knew that, and everyone did it anyway. And listen, um, and it was just. Oh, go sorry, go sorry, on. cut you off. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, man, I couldn't be like. That that day, even though it's one of the worst days in a way, like I could not have been more proud of having like been with those lads that day. Like you know, they were just because I, I literally as well. I only got put in that team. I got moved from another platoon to take over that team that morning just for the day. Yeah. So I never even worked with these lads before, um, and I just like the pride, like that that moment of pride, man. That's just something that I'll take. Like that was a, it was a, it finished as a tragedy. But those lads, I you know, I worked with that day with the team of lads who literally, we all thought we were going to get fucking brassed up doing it, and they did it anyway. And we did it, we did as much as we could, and um, you know, that's just I'm just talking about it. so proud of those lads, man. Yeah, the thing that uh, people who might not have experienced these things or might not be um, a military member <clears throat> might not understand is how complex a situation like that is, you know. If you've got a driver who's a casualty, who's a casualty, like you have to understand that he's under fucking, he's under a hatch, he's under inches of armor, he's strapped into a fucking seat. You know there might be mangled metal that's trapping him in that in that in that uh, vehicle or whatever. Let me. I'll ask you the question. I already know the answer. How much equipment do you have to extract him? Do you have those fucking things that the fire brigade have cutting shears or? Fuck all, mate. We thought we um, honestly we we thought we were gonna have to cut his leg off to get him out. Yeah. Um, but like we managed to literally wrench him out in the end because his, his legs were in his, his legs were in bits. But we thought the, when the Merc came in, they were like, "We're gonna have to cut his leg off," um, you know, to get him out of there because the whole front of the vehicle was buckled. That's something that I never really, I'd seen obviously IEDs in Iraq and stuff, but EFPs, like because it's because it's like a, a superheated cop slug, it kind of they kind of punch through. They don't wreck something in the same way that like these this homemade explosive does and when i was just i was looking at the crater earlier i'm um, not earlier so i was looking at the crater when it was all done and i was like jesus like the size of the explosion like this front of the warrior was torn apart you know and there's this huge hole in the ground and and the, to be honest mate the miracle was that i just thought i can't believe any of us have, like because the t- like the two guys in the turret one of them had to get catted out because he was he couldn't feel his legs yeah. Um, he had spine damage um, but the commander he got knocked out but us guys in the back we walked away from that like and I just like I, and I still can't get my head around it now so I uh, fucking hell whoever made those warriors man like they're not they weren't great for Afghan but at the end of the day like it, I just can't believe that we fucking walked out from that like I'm sitting at the end of a table here now it's literally the distance from here to this huge explosion and we walked away from it like yeah. it's, it's mad yeah, it's it, it is fucking insane. And like another another uh, thing that popped into my head there about IEDs is um, you would get a, a briefing every night, you know, by a platoon commander, or whatever, come in, give you a daily briefing about what you're doing, what how that day went that you just had, and what's coming up tomorrow, and what you're doing for the future in, in terms of ops for the next week or the next month. Uh, but you'd also get an update of what's going on in 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 general. And you would get a list of how many K- KIA, how many boys that have been killed, and um, what incidents had hap- had happened throughout the the the, the British AO. Um, and every single night that that fucking summer, one guy, two guys, fucking four guys, uh, uh, a full section of uh, guys from the rifles had been wiped out. I remember hearing that in in, in an O group, and I was like you must be fucking taking the piss a full section. And like, everyone was like, what are you talking about? That, that's not real. Um, and then and, and it ended up, it was a full section of uh, boys from the rifles had been taken out um, with IEDs placed inside the wall and they'd, they'd stacked up against the wall. Someone had set the pressure plate off and the, the, 
the IED had came out and it took the whole fucking section out. I mean, they they, they never all died, but they were all ca mm -hmm. casualties. Um, and you know, we're we're getting this briefing every single night, and you know, it never done anything for morale, but it just made us realize that right, this is fucking it. this like it's it's no joke, and we didn't need that reinforcement to understand it wasn't no joke because we were living it anyway, but. It just really did, like, it hit home. And you always felt worse for the guys who, who you were hearing about rather than what you were living, you know? And what we were living wasn't the greatest. We were fucking... We were we were getting it just as bad as anyone else, sometimes if not worse. And uh, the one thing that, from that tour that will really stick into me is that as we were handing over, not personally us, but as our Herrick 10 tour was handing over Herrick 11, the guys coming in, they went on the range and um, I think it was a guards battalion. Yeah. They're going on the was, range yeah. at, at Bastion and they fucking hit an, uh, they hit a, I don't know if it was one or uh, a daisy chain of IDs yeah. on the range. Now these are guys who are not ready for it. They're, they're, they're expecting that they're in a fucking safe environment. They're going to the range to zero the weapons for fuck's sake. Yeah. They're not in the mental state prepared to be in that environment and you know, I heard that and I think maybe one or two guys had lost their lives and, you know, I think maybe one other tra uh, traumatic uh, amputation. But, you know, that was, a, that was, that for me was the worst because it wasn't the worst injury by far, but it was the worst because of the mindset that those boys would have been in. It would have been such a shock to the system. Whereas the other guys who were in Sangin, who were in Musicala, who were in Babaji, who were in Nadi Ali, they were already ready for it. But to yeah. be hit, when you're fucking expecting you know to be safe is is a a mental mental torture to to have to deal with um anyway i just uh we'll we'll get to your uh sorry mate Go sorry ahead. i just I just just passing on the dinner orders <laughs> can we do an hour please <laughs> yeah anyway yeah, so like I was, I was just going to say, mate, just one yeah. on that, I was going to say real quick, is um, the one I always feel really bad for like that is the handover takeovers. Because uh, I know that that's happened. Um, one of my mates, when he was on a, he was on a handover takeover in Iraq, one of the lads, one of the lads that end the tour, gets shot, through the, gets shot through the neck, drops down dead in the back, last patrol. Uh, and one of, the, one of the fusiliers in our battle group in Iraq, happened, um, sorry, Afghanistan, happened to him, handover takeover patrol, IED, dead. I always, I always feel really bad for those guys. Um, one of the worst ones I've ever heard of was when we got, when we got back from Iraq. Um, some of the rifles lads, four rifles lads, after we'd been through really, they'd had a really hard tour, um, literally just drove out the camp gate and got an RTA. I think it was three of them got killed. Um, yeah. And I just thought, Jesus Christ, their families, like imagine that, man. Your families think you're home and you drive out of camp and you die, three of you. It's fucking like, that's me. That, that to me is heartbreaking. But it's the families, mate. I think it's the families you think more about as you get older. You start to think about family more. Yeah. Right, so Afghan for you was a, a, a very pivotal tour. Um, and you ended up writing a book about it. So if you wouldn't mm. mind, uh, just just give a brief uh, overview of, of how that book came about. <sighs> so when I was in, in Iraq, I did keep journals and stuff, but I never really made that much of an effort. But I decided in Afghan I was going to, because even in that two-year period, I'd already started forgetting stuff about Iraq. And I thought, I don't want to do this with Afghan. So I took out some journals with me. And the other thing as well is in Afghan, Afghan you know the score, you're in a PB. You haven't got electricity and stuff to do anything anyway. So I thought it would be a good way of keeping myself occupied. Um, basically, uh, 2012, so I did my, I did my all arms PTI card when I was in the, in the army. And I came out and I, I came out of the army, started working in the gym. Um, and then the gym closed. So one of my mates was doing the ship security. So I figured I'd jump on that. So I got on the, got, started doing the boats and I've always wanted to do some writing. It's always been something I wanted to do. So I started having, once I was on the boats, I finally had the time to start writing. Um, I didn't particularly want to write an Afghanistan book, but, um, I'm quite savvy, like with, um, marketing and stuff. And I knew that the, the way for me to get into writing wasn't to turn up and say, Hey, I've written this new thriller or whatever. It was for me to be like, Hey, I am, uh, I'm an enlisted soldier that's written his own book because that just doesn't really happen that much. Like almost every enlisted book that's been written is usually ghostwritten. Yeah. Um, well, mo to be honest, most military books are ghostwritten. 
Um, um, but then you get a lot of like officer books. And I thought nobody's nobody. I thought I'm not really seeing any kind of like big books published by squaddies. So um, I started to just expand on what was in my journal, started to write my thoughts, but I also, I wanted to, I didn't just want to write about the tour. I wanted to write about just some of the stuff that had come after it, you know, because again, that seemed to be to me, nobody, nobody was really writing about that. People, they write this book and it just finishes on the last day of tour. And I'm thinking, well, it's not really, it's your tour doesn't finish on the last day of tour. Yeah. You know, like what happens that first night you come back and have a beer? What happens that first time you try and go out with a girl for the first time? What happens when you lose your temper for the first time? You know, that's, that's as much of the tour as the rest of it. So I wrote all about that kind of stuff. And um, it was one of those ones where it did open the door for me because it, it got, um, I was very lucky. I didn't have any trouble finding an agent. Um, I didn't have any trouble finding a publisher. But these kind of things come around in waves. And it wasn't a good time for publishing that kind of book at the moment at, at the time. But the, the, but they'd seen like a good enough sample of work in there that they wanted to work with me on other things. So I started doing a series of books with Penguin, uh, which is like historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and then we waited for the right moment. Um, we waited for the right moment. Where, and it's like... Oh, uh, you kind of got this wave, I'd say probably 2017, the, these books started getting popular again. Um, and then I got, you know, I, I wrote um, with Major Jowett. I was very, very lucky to be invited onto that project to work with him. We did a book called No Way Out. Um, so that was good. That, so that one actually got published before my own. And then I kept adding to mine because obviously more was happening in my life because when I first wrote it, it was the tour and then it was the down. Yeah. But then like, luckily then there was a couple more years because I could write about the up because yeah. I do think, I do think that it, I went through the worst period of my life after tour, but then I went through the best period of my life coming out the other side of it. Right. Um, so yeah, I got deal with Pam McMillan. Uh, we put out the paper back in 2019. Um, just missed out. I think we got to like number 12, just, just missed out on the top 10 on the best foot seller list. Um, which I was a bit disappointed about, but then it was a weird one because at the time I was genuinely disappointed because, you know, with competitive people, I was like, oh, well, it's a top 10. And then I started to get messages from people saying that they'd found the book really helpful and stuff. And I was like, what the fuck does the top 10 actually matter? It, like literally, like, what does that, that doesn't matter at all. What matters is how is this book actually helping anybody and stuff. And um, again, this year kind of fucked things up because the, you know, with it being COVID, it's, sales and stuff and like exactly what what i would have hoped for if you'd have asked me two years ago but then i get messages from people that i've never met you know saying hey i came across your book on such and such and um I i've never served but now i understand my brother or now i understand my husband or yeah. uh, my son was killed and now i know what my son was like that they're the worst dude not the worst they're the best but also like i just don't feel on on like almost just feel like i don't have i'm not worthy of having that conversation with someone if you know what i mean it's like because i just think like who, who the fuck am i to be in a position to be able to tell somebody like because they ask for advice so i'm like who the fuck am i to be able to give you advice yeah. but at the same time it's it's amazing and it, it's way and um I, it's, it's been it's been good mate like it's um i feel like it was a weird one because i i know it sounds really fucking weird man but when i put it out i almost felt like more comfortable with the whole thing of like, I don't mind dying now because I've know that I've left something that's helped other people. I know that sounds really weird, but it just just it just genuinely made me feel like, even if I don't do anything else now, I've done something that I know is going to be around to help other people for yeah. the next 20, 30, 40 years or whatever. And um, and it was good. It was nerve nerve wracking as well to put you to put yourself out there. I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty fucking nerve wracking, but I'm glad I did it. Were you, when you wrote that book then, were you, were you doubtful of yourself in terms of your writing ability? Um, had you, you know, had you any formal training bef in, in writing before that? Not, no formal training. I mean, well, I say no formal training. Obviously I went to school, I got my GCSEs, got my A-levels, yeah. I did a degree in history. Um, I, I don't hold degrees in much value because I know I didn't go to any classes and I just did everything late and everything rushed and I still got a degree. So I honestly don't have, I just don't have, I'm sorry if you got a degree, it means nothing to me. Like it just doesn't. Um, but I taught myself how to write books. And I, and the reason I, I, the way I say that I taught myself 
is I read and I read and I read and I read. I didn't do courses on it or anything like that. I just read fucking hundreds of books. Yeah. Um, and, and if and I kind of like just took it on like that. Um, but I knew I knew I could write, and I knew I was a good writer. But I did worry about what I call the X factor factor because those cunts that go on X factor who think they're good, they think they're good. Even though they're terrible, they think they're good. And I thought, right, I'm looking at what I'd done. And I thought, I really think this is good. But am I just deceiving myself? Yes. Um, so I gave it to a few people. That I, I, I'm, I'm lucky that I have a few friends in my life who are like successful artists, as in like in music and stuff. And I was like, will you read this and give me an honest opinion? Um, because I was like, I don't, I don't know if I might genuinely be deceiving myself. I didn't think that I was because to be honest, I've always been the kind of person I look at myself and I go, you're fat. I, I think you're not trying hard enough. If I come, I've come second on every card that I like, well, not every card, but I come second on a lot of cards that I've done. And I'm like, you didn't come first. Do you know what I mean? I've always been kind of really critical. I'm, second guy. So I, I'm second. Yeah. Second, Dave. <laughs> yeah. So but that's me, mate. Like, Oh, I'm always fucking second. But I thought, uh, if you ain't first, you're last. But I always thought, like, um, I thought the chances that I'm now being nice to myself about something, I thought it's probably not the case. I am probably being really hard on myself. And um, and I, I think that um, I, I, I do believe that most people have something that they're good at. And I think it makes sense that mine would be writing because I spent half my life fucking reading. So, you know, it just made sense that that's I, I'm a better writer than I'm a soldier. Put it that way. Yeah. Well, I've done the same. So, like, um, in terms of the the your your book, the reason you started the journal was because you forgot everything, and I was the exact same. Two years later, I forgot everything from the first two, and it was the best time of my life. It was extreme, beyond belief, and I couldn't remember any of it. So I thought, fuck it, like this time I'm going to write a journal. Uh, so I took a just a daily entry every single day. Um, and I start in the past year and a bit. I've started putting that into a, a book. I'm about a hundred thousand words at the minute, which is, I think that's probably a bit too much, but I've got about another 30,000 to go before I, I get to the end of the first draft and they'll start cutting stuff out. But yeah, go, go big first and then cut. Yeah. So <laughs> the, our, the first day is uh, the first is like the last night out before the, the first day deploying. And um so in the book, it talks about like what, how how I woke up on that after that night out. So I end up waking up in the 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 family's estate, and I'm like, right, fuck, who the fuck, whose wife have I fucked? And then I, I start I start to like I wake up, I'm completely naked. I, th- I start to like get try and find some clothes, and I realize right, I'm with the company clerk, so it's gr- it's good. I'm not I'm not with anyone's wife, so no need to worry. And then I talk about how how like we're like fooling around on the on the sofa downstairs and got the big babylons in my face and all this sort of stuff and then i put it out there to the boys and i was like what do you think and they're like maybe it's a bit too graphic <laughs> oh, you can be you can be graphic in a book mate but no no but like I... for like a, as an opener like I, i've looked back on it and i was like and, and i'm being i'm being like i'm being tame when i describe it it was like it was a bit too graphic you know as an opener it was, it, it, was people, it, it was attractive, but it was probably it, it probably wouldn't sell many um, many copies. But yeah, well, I've got uh, a semi. I've got a semi right now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, we'll see where that goes. But um, anyway, what were some of the things that you done in the, in, the, in the army in terms of courses or or um, I don't know, cadres or anything that, that you look back on and you think they're they're actually impactful for me and my my de- my development as a soldier i mean it all adds up doesn't it like i i got taught a really good lesson uh one of the ones that stuck with me from like that ta junior nco card i did was we, we had a there was a, a section commander from was, was from the rifles because you have the same you have the itc staff but they just do like the ta one yeah. and there was a lad where they had done a fire team attack and or section attack and halfway through the corporal got me to take over because this lad was just fucking pants um, and at the end of it, he was like debriefing the lad, and the lad's like, "Well, I tried my best." And the corporal said to him, "He's like, this is why I fucking hate you, Jake." And he's like, <laughs> "He's like, trying your best isn't good enough. What are you, what are you gonna do when you're on tour and one of your lads die? You're gonna say to his mum, oh, I tried my best. 
And that lesson stuck with me um, because when you're in the military, trying your best isn't good enough. You have to do it. Like, yeah. and, and like, you know, like trying your best, maybe like you might have to die. Like for one of your lads, you might have to die. So, so you don't have to look at that mum and go, oh, I tried my best. You know, so that lesson, I don't remember that much. I don't really remember anything else from that card, but that lesson, I can see it as clear as day in my head now. Um, and I actually bumped into him in the NAFI on, uh, on Salad 10, almost exactly to the day, because I looked at my journal entry for yesterday and I saw, the, saw it in there. So, um, you know, I thank him for that lesson. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed the PTI card. I think that was, that was a good one for me. That, to be honest, I wish it'd come earlier because I made like good friends with a few lads from one para. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if that had happened earlier, I would have, uh, I'd already made my mind up at that point that I was, uh, that I was done with the army because I couldn't handle garrison life. It just yeah. wasn't for me. Um, but I think if I'd have done that NCO card a while ago, I, I would have probably, um, like if I always say, if I had my time again, I probably would have tried to the point, gone down the parachute, uh, parachute regiment route because, um, I, I, I like the way that I like that kind of whole ethos, um, but I didn't know any paras back then. Yeah. So it's only it's, and now my life is full of the fucking cunts. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can't get away from them. Fucking paras and marines, uh, as in like American marines. My life's full of them. But yeah, um, yeah look, that that's something in, I I, enjoy, I enjoyed that. It just kind of just reminded me about how much I just I just love fizz. Like I just like I just I really really love fizz and it's uh, and. The army in general, I think you can take fizz one or two ways from it. Like for me, it's a part of my life that, that like I was already doing fizz before I joined the army, but that made that a lot of people drop out of fizz in their early twenties and then never get back into it. So I'm glad that I had the army to kind of like, it cemented it as part of my life and not just something that I do, but something that I loved. Like I loved being a garrison PTI. I fucking loved that job doing like three or four PT sessions a day. Fucking loved it. Um, so that's something that I've taken away from that I really love. But man, this this like I, I love the fucking army, mate, and I love my time. I love my time on operations. Like all my complaints about operations are about not getting to be in enough fighting. Like that's yeah. generally like that's that's my complaints are stuff. Like, my complaints are stuff like the OC not letting us go out on three man fighting patrols. <laughs> that's the kind of thing I'm fucking complaining about. Because I wanted to, I wanted to be like Vietnam, where I just be like, hey, me and the boys are gonna take a machine gun and go and start some shit. And they'd be like, okay, like that's that's what my complaints about. I've never complained about scrapping. Like my complaints are stuff like, um, you know, oh well, you can't you can't take this patrol out because you've only got ten guys. You got about twelve or whatever. It's like bullshit like that. I'm like let's just go and fucking fight. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I, I love to do that. I'd love to be able to love to, to, to do it again. But at the same time, I can't do it again. And I, I think that um, I'm more successful in what I do now because of my time in the army. But it's also given me, um, you know, I, I, I think so, for instance, the frustration that I got of not getting to go on tour when I wanted to because of like relying on other people to do paperwork. Well, guess what? I don't fucking rely on anybody else to do any shit anymore. Like if people, if stuff's not getting done now by other people, I'm fucking on them, you know, and I learned like that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's even when you need to have somebody else do things, cause it's not, you can't do everything in your life, but even when you are reliant on other people, it's still on you to be on them and on them and on them and on them. Um, but like, I, I, I know I was speaking to someone the other day because he was on about people being haunted from Afghanistan. And I was like, dude, I said, like, I used to have nightmares. I, I, I haven't had a nightmare for years now, but I guarantee at least once a week, I'm having a dream where I wake up. I was in Afghan. I wake up. I'm like, fuck, I fucking thought I was back there. And, you know, <laughs> and that, that, that's always disappointing because I genuinely like, if fuck, God help you. If, if I'm having a good dream about tour and you wake me up, you're in fucking trouble. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> hey, just talking about that, like, and thinking about how guys were coming back from, uh, the First World War and the Second World War, obviously they never had anything like the the availability that we have to spread our message and even just to, to talk about individual experiences. How much do you think that they were going through the exact same thing? Because I have a, a, an inclination that they have the same view. Um, I don't know, actually. I don't know if, I, I don't know what the word would be, but it, I think we glorify it more than it's, than it's, than it's glorified. I think we respect it a lot more. 
but we value it as well. I don't know what the fucking word is, but it's just something that we hold dear to us. I wonder if those boys held their experiences dear to them or if they resented it because it was, you know, a different a different war. It was a war for a different reason. I think you've got to remember one, one, a big distinction is like, I think you, I'm going to guess now that you grew up wanting to do the job, same as I did. Yeah. So for us, it was something that we wanted to do that we got to do. For a lot of people in those big wars that were conscripted, it wasn't something that they ever wanted to do, but they had to go and do it. So I think that's an important distinction. Um, I read a book by a guy called uh, George MacDonald Fraser. Uh, He was in Burma with the infantry in the Second World War. And he was saying that like there wasn't like there's always a part of him that would look out the window when he was in his office and think, God, I wish the war was back on. Um, I've spoken to Vietnam veterans that feel the same way. I've spoken to World War II veterans that feel the same way. Yeah. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's plenty that were like that was the worst thing that ever happened to me, and I never want to think about it. And I'm sure there was plenty who were like, "Fucking hell, I enjoyed that," you know? Because <laughs> it's because tell me what like for me, it's not even necessarily the fighting. But I remember before we used to go onto ops into Basra, and like quite often we'd be at the front like with the warriors. I'd be up at the I, like before we went out, we'd all be lined up ready to go. And I'd stand up on the top of the warrior and I'd look back at this line of armor, just warrior after warrior after warrior. And then we've got the challengers with us. And I was just like, fuck yeah. yeah. Like, this is what it's all about. This is the fucking shit. This is what I've wanted. Because when I, I get asked a lot, I'm sure you get the same. People are always like, did you ever want to go SF? I thought about it, like a lot of other people. But what I wanted was to be conventional infantry in big fucking battles. That's what I want. What gives me the fucking boner is a fucking armoured battle group charging into a fucking city. That's yeah. what gives me a fucking boner. Not like jumping in off a fucking plane. Like, I thought that stuff's amazing. I take my hat off to those blokes, but I wanted a big old fucking conventional, like Fallujah 2004. That's what I wanted. Yeah. And those, uh, those, those Fallujah battles that, you know, where you got a huge, huge cordon of fucking warriors and fucking uh, army, and then you've got a full brigade of marines fucking tearing through there and SF and SEALs and all sorts. That's, that doesn't happen every fucking, every deployment. No. It doesn't happen every war. That there is, you know, those boys that were there, like we, t- like we were talking about earlier on, they were lucky, they were privileged to have that bestowed upon them and they were lucky enough to be there at that specific time to be a part of that and like like we talked about earlier as, as well that that will be with them for the rest of their life that is their legacy you know they were there that's that's theirs they own it um just like i, I don't know fucking somebody like myself like i was there in panchai palang i like i'm part of it that's my legacy i was there I own it as well. And just, just like you fucking Iraq, Afghanistan, you own all your own experiences as well. Um, no one's ever going to be able to take that away from you. And, and you know, those are very valuable to, to the individual person that they, they are, but they mean fuck all to everyone else. They, they yeah. really do. When they come down to yeah, it, they yeah. mean nothing to anyone else. Um, and that's, that's a, a good way to, that's a good way for me to, to remind myself that, you know, just because I've done all this shit doesn't make me fucking, it doesn't make me hot shit. I've done some really fucking cool shit, but there's also a lot of boys who have done a lot cooler shit and a lot fucking harder shit and much higher tier level than me. You know, I, I ain't nothing, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm more than proud to have done my, my part and said my part, but it's, uh, it's, it's good. And it's one of those memories of, on deployments that, you know, of that time in Pancha Palang and, uh, Afghan 2009 that I'll just never forget and it will stay with me forever um, but what what were some more the some of the more memorable memorable experiences for you that um, in terms of you know maybe there's a specific incident or a specific time frame that you you look back on and think right these are some examples that are, are most memorable to me I think the first contact when I got to put rounds down through the gym fee in Afghan was probably be the most memorable because when I was in Iraq, we were on Card Alpha, which is bonkers because the whole thing was going mad. It's just, but I was so, like I said, like I was very kind of like always scared. I was used to be scared of the army, if you see what I mean. So like they were like, well, unless you see you shooting at, you can't shoot back. 
So, you know, you're getting shot at in, Af- in Iraq. There's fucking thousands of windows around. I didn't know who was shooting at me, so I never fired my weapon. I'd just be like, oh, I guess I'm, guess I'm going to die then. You know, same with IEDs. <laughs> like, oh, I'll just go and kick over this thing. I guess I'm going to die. By the time I got to Afghan, I had a bit of, I was more under the effect. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I'm just fucking firing this time. Um, and we were under like different ROA anyway. But it was also like, obviously, <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like my, yeah, we were on 429 Alpha. But like my first experience of, of of kind of like my first experience of combat in Afghanistan was obviously getting blown up and then losing a guy, um, and then so that sucked. And then um, my jimpy was on the floor of the the warrior when it happened when we got blown up. So I said I wanted to test fire it, and they wouldn't let me test fire it, which is just bonkers. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a contact happened, and I could see um, it. It wasn't actually a contact against us. But it, it started moving. It was against the checkpoint on the other side of the wadi, but it started moving towards us and it was in range of the jimpy. It was probably about 600 meters. And um, I could see uh, the Taliban, I could see them going between these compounds. And I, I was like, right, fucking getting in on this. I was like, they don't even know I'm here. This is amazing. And jimpy went fire because it turned out there was a tiny little spring in there somewhere that was fucked. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, we, yeah. we would have been the, we the like, yeah, I had to get the jimpy replaced as it turned out. But that was one of the most frustrating moments of my life to literally be looking down the barrel and having these Taliban running back and forth and I couldn't even engage. Um, so I got the jimpy replaced and a few days later, we went for a patrol down towards like the, the, uh, the flat and um, we got opened up on, we were all in the open. It was like an L-shaped ambush and it was just nuts because you know, it's like, you know, here, it's like all this clapping in the air and, you know, and, there's, and it's like, oh my God, oh my God. And then you're like, Oh shit, we're in an open field. This is like actually really kind of dangerous. Yeah. Um, and that's that's one where my mate got shot in the neck. And um, I just ran, I like as soon as he kicked off, I just like ran down the front. I ran down, down to the front because I was on the back end. I ran down the front, just fucking just jumped down, fucking, and just just start smashing through. I think I went through about six, I think I went through about six, eight hundred rounds in that contact. And it was just fucking it was just awesome because I basically just decided just did my own thing for that whole contact because me and my mate just <laughs> running around doing our own thing like we just positioned ourselves at the front and then when it was the back we were at the back so we kept we kept going through the entire thing yeah and then it was funny because like nearly halfway through there one of my mates nearly ran into my axe so me and him like there's rounds going overhead and um, but me and him just forgot about the Taliban and we're just like I'm like I'll fucking kill you cunt he's like I'll fucking smash you up so me and him are getting pulled apart from each other in the middle of this contact um, and then the warriors come in and the warriors are like boom, 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 boom on the fucking, yeah. on, on the, on the cannons. And then we got the mortars coming in and I was just like, this is fucking amazing. Like, and that, that to me, cause there was other contacts and stuff, but to me, that will always be the special one because it was just, it was, it was the relief of well, of like one of the lads is like shot in the neck, but then he survives. Yeah. So it's like, it, fe- it felt like we got away with something as well. It felt like we got, it felt like we went, we stuck our head in the oven and we, we pulled out without anything happened to us. And, um, that day I, I, um, I saw there was a couple of them coming down from some, some from cover and I fired a couple of bursts and they ran straight into the second burst. Uh, and that was fucking awesome. And it's just everything that could have gone well, went well and everything that could have gone bad. We got lucky on. Cause here's the other thing. When we went back to that area the next time, um, we found like 20 IEDs just yeah. by luck, just by luck. We missed every ID. Like, so that day, cause it ended up with like five of us coming back in bags, you know? Um, it was just, it was just, it was awesome. And like, there was other days that were a bit like that, but that was the first one. And because I done like, I had so much frustration after Iraq. It was like, it was like doing no nut November and you finally get to blow your load. <laughs> like, that's what it was like. Yeah, it's a good feeling, isn't it? Getting fucking in those uh, those big hectic oh, contacts. They they never for me, like we said earlier on, it's a it's an individual thing. But for me, they never were scary. Like you can't see yeah. any rounds. There's no reason whatsoever to be scared. When you get close and personal with the enemy, it's I don't know. You know you know you can massively outmuscle them if it ever came to it. You know you've got your bayonet there if you're a rifleman. If you're a gun, then you fucking you've got that just to rip them rip them to Club. shreds. And, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Honestly, there's the, the I never ever once felt scared. Um, How do you feel about IEDs? Well, I was a point man in my second deployment, um, and you know, as 
without fucking sending a gun here and sending like you know shoot my own shot i uh i volunteered for it and it's because there was a lance shack and i never had a role so i was part of the recce and i, I wasn't a team two ic or you know I, I never had a role i was essentially just a bod and it happens in the, in the recce it's a, a rank heavy uh platoon so some eventually some guys are going to not have any roles and um you know we had platoon sergeant uh yeah guys at sergeants doing such commander jobs platoon commander doing platoon uh, section section commander jobs so then it comes down to land shack and you're essentially just a bod but i'd had a good ex a good amount of experience before me and a very well tra uh, very well trained and a, a very well taught understanding of uh how to deal with IDs and how how to use a violin and all this shit from the my previous tour, my my search commander, you know, treated me very well. So when it came around to the second tour and I never had a job, I was like, right, I either just milk it at the back of the platoon carrying a fucking chub, or uh, I step up and you know at least at least show the other the younger guys or the private the privates or the guys in in my in my section in my platoon that I'm that I'm willing and I'm capable and able to. To step up to the mark so i volunteered for point man i had a gun i had an lmg um but we were lucky enough to not be ground holding that we never had to seek out ieds like ground holding uh you know units might do like a, if you're based in a cp or or a fob whatever we were always doing strike stuff and cordons for other ops and you know you know um you know deception fucking ops and all this sort of stuff that we were never the ground holding unit in the AO. So anywhere we were going, if we ever found an ID, we'd have to call an ATO and it would be a fucking, that would be the op ruined. So as point man, it was my job to, to identify potential areas where IDs, they were, they either were or might be and avoid that either marking or just, you know, by telling the guys or picking an alternate route or picking a route that would negate that completely. And uh, I ended up getting the nickname Davy Ditches because I was never out of the fucking ditches and we were going through, uh, we were going through um, er, like plowed fields, plowed wet, muddy fields, fucking nonstop. And the guys hated me, but listen, they all came back with their fucking legs. So yeah. they, they the two, they're all happy. And I'll tell you yeah. one funny story. Like one time that um, we ended up having Estonians attached to us and one up and they were briefed. They were said, listen, follow this guy. Do not go off the, off the proven track, blah, 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 all this sort of shit. So anyway, we ended up going on patrol. It was cold and we were going for ditches and it was fucking freezing. Um, and sun, it was, uh, sun was just coming up and the, we ended up going through this plowed field and it was wet and it was miserable, really miserable. And the Estonians, they, they, they had had enough and they didn't want any anything of it. And so they'd cut off and they'd started to, to make their own way towards the objective compound, the compound, <clears throat> compound of interest. And... Um, I could see them. They were heading straight for like one of these little footpath bridges. And I was like, I got in the fucking PRR to the boss. I said, boss, those boys are going straight for that bridge. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get on the net to tell them to stop. And as soon as they, before he could even get through to them, obviously comms with different nations is hard, you know, because they're on different means. So by the time he could even get the message to them, the guy had already crossed the bridge and fucking stepped on a, a an ID. Um, just because he wouldn't follow me, he they didn't want to fucking didn't follow. Don't want me. to be cold and wet, mate. They, yeah, they didn't want to be it cold. Had to be and cold wet. and wet. Them. I tell you what, mate. they were super lucky that it was only a partial debt. But the guy ended up losing. I uh, don't know if he lost his foot, but he ended up losing his boot at least and fucking his foot up uh, massively. <laughs> but um, I was just like, that was the only incident we had in that that uh, tour with IEDs, other than like road roadside, uh, you know. IEDs and roads and attacks on vehicles and stuff like that. We had a few of them that ended up being partial debts and small IEDs that never came to anything. But um, yeah, like I was never scared of them because I always was super confident in my ability to detect them and and you know negate the fact that if you just don't go near them, then you won't get hit. But I think my confidence was uh, it was almost like a mask. Because if I wasn't super confident, then I, w I wouldn't be able to be confident. Um, to be honest with me, that's, that's a, good, a really good point. Because when I think back on it, the times where it shit me up was always them being like, right, you've got to go down this route or you've got to go through this choke point. Yeah. That's the times where I was always like, we, we even had it when we were in Afghan once. There was, they were like, 
there was a choke point between compounds and they were like, right, we've got an int rep that there's an ID here. Go and check it out. I'm like, wait, so you think there's an ID there? A command, it was a command wire one. So there's a command wire ID and they're like, right, go and check it out. I'm like, all right, so what? I'm just expected to just go and die, am I? Like, like, cause they were, I, I didn't, couldn't even go around. They were like, literally just, you need yeah. to go just down the middle and check it. So I took one other lad with me and I was just like, I can't believe this is how I'm going to die. But that, that was when it used to shit me up. But like, if we're going through the fields and stuff, yeah. Cause you can cut your own tracks then. But it was just when they'd be like, right, here's the choke point, go and die. I'm like, I don't, don't really want to go die, but I don't want to look like a pussy either. So I guess I'll go and die. Yeah. I got super lucky. My boss just let me have free roam. He, he would just say, take me to compound 48 or take me to this, this fucking intersection or whatever. And I would literally pull up my map and make my own route out of, out of thin air. And the boys would just follow me, you know? And, um, I think, I think empowering subordinates was, was massively, that was a massive lesson for me in, in empowering subordinates. And it was a, a very good leadership lesson. And the boss there at the time was, you know, phenomenal, um, and it's just it's simple things like that. He's not being the outright leader, giving up and standing up and giving a, 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 a speech that we all shout hurrah at the end of. But, you know, a simple thing like, oh, yeah, you just fucking take me there, mate. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, Roger. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> what were some of your uh, some of your personal highlights then from your time in the, the time in the army? Highlights, mate. Just meeting the boys. Yeah. Love the boys. Does that does that really mean? Obviously, you enjoy putting around through the gympie. Like, I don't give a fuck what anyone says. There's no cooler weapon. There's no cooler weapon than a gympie. It's amazing. Like, I was lucky as well, mate. I was like you. I was a lance jack in recce, so I was just like, because, like, let's be honest. Hard, it's hard work carrying eight hundred rounds in a fucking gympie, and yeah. I was one of the fitter blokes. So I was just like, just let me have the gympie. So, so I, I like petitioned to have the gympie, and when I got it, I was like. <laughs> like I thought this is what I'm here this is what I'm here for fucking Vietnam movie gympy shit yeah. um, so putting rounds through a gympy mate is always I'm not sure if I ever put round through a rifle to be honest um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure about that one but yeah I fucking love the gympy and um, just the boys mate like I've got I've got lots of good mates from Civvy Street too yeah. but to have like the literal like the literal brothers in arms um, that's just amazing and like you said mate like there's always going to be a part of us that's going to be like, oh, I wish I was at D-Day or I wish I was in Vietnam. Or this. There's always going to be that part. But at the end of the day, like I said, man, we still got ridiculously lucky to get to do what we got to do. Like, yeah. there's like, and I, I don't think I realized how lucky we were to do that. And now, I'm, I mean, at the end of the day, just to have one contact is lucky. And we got to have a bunch of them. So, yeah, yeah I, I feel very lucky, mate, to, to have known the blokes and to have got to do to have actually got to have soldiered in, in two different places. Oh, I feel very fortunate. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, right then, so taking a bit of a turn into your uh, your post-army career, how did the Veteran State of Mind podcast come about? Not sure. Probably drunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm honestly not sure how it, how it came about, mate. I really can't, um, I really can't remember how it came about, um, but it's here. And um, it was, I think, I'm not sure why it started. I honestly am. That's not bullshit. Ass. I genuinely can't remember. Um, but it's worked out really well. Because I, I mean, I, I've always listened to a lot, not always, but last few years, I listened to a lot of podcasts. So I think I probably just said to myself, oh, I might as well do my own podcast as well. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, it, it's, it's just been great because it means that there's time every week where, because I work on my own, obviously, writing. I'm on my own a lot. It's time every week to talk, um, and which is so important. And it, it's it's a great excuse to it's a great excuse to reach out to people that you wouldn't necessarily have a connection with otherwise. Yeah. Um, and it's like I don't go and I don't go and give time to a charity or anything like that. But I feel like the podcast is in a way my kind of giving back to people because I feel like it gives advice to young people. It gives advice to people in the military and it gives advice to people after the military. Um, and I do think that even if it's just some of the episodes are sensible, some of the episodes were just having a laugh. Um, yeah. But I think every episode has something of value in it. And like that, that to me has been my kind of like, I do, I do one less book a year because since I've done the podcast, because of the time in it. So I've taken a financial hit and stuff by doing it, but my life feels a lot better for doing it. 
which I think is a good lesson in itself. It ain't all about money. Yeah. You know, like you've only got so much time and it's up to you what you use to do that time with. But for me, doing that podcast has been a lot better return of value on my life than doing an extra book would be. I'd have some more money for doing a book, but great. So what? I'd be fucking like, what, what, who, who, like what's the point? Like yeah. doing the podcast, I get a benefit from it because I get to learn from the conversations. Other people get to benefit from it. So it's a fucking, it's a win. It's a win-win all around. I, I really enjoy it, mate. Like, I really do. I look forward to it. And who have been some of the guests that you've had on that you've you've really taken a lot of uh, a lot of uh, value from? Well, the one of the ones that stands out for me was um, Stephen Pressfield, who was uh, one of my he's been my, like one of my favorite authors for the last twenty years. So to have a conversation with him for an hour and like we we kind of pal, you know we're kind of like pals now. And I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to Stephen Pressfield. It's fucking mental. Like, it's just <laughs> someone who 20 years ago, I could never believe that was happening. Now we just drop each other fucking text. And I'm like, oh. um, Captain Dale Dye. Uh, people will know him from like the, basically he made war movies what they are now. Like if you've seen a good war movie like Band of Brothers, it's because of Dale Dye. End of. Like that's the shit bust. Um, I'd met him before he actually, I, I went around his house once for a, for a coffee. I got in touch with him and he invited me over for coffee. And I was just like, Fuck, he's a great bloke. And to have him on the podcast and talk about him fighting in Way City in, in Iraq, you know, again, just one of those battles that comes around every 20 years. And to be able to talk to him about it was amazing. Um, talked to a few Vietnam veterans. Cal Malentes was one recently. Um, amazing. Like, and it's been cool. Like, I, I don't, I haven't put it out yet, but you you know, John did one with John. Um, and to know, you know, I have to have a chat with someone that was in the same place at the same time, but doing, like, you know, we probably passed each other. Yeah. You know, we we probably passed each other. We'd be involved in the same ops, but to have his, to have his, you know, John Smith, guys will know him as a hostile operator. You know, that was, I really enjoyed the conversation with him. We, we, we recorded last week. Um, but he, he was, uh, he was contracted then out in, out in, uh, Marja when I was out there in hmm. 2009 on her, on, I think Herrick 10. But yeah, anyway, he I don't know, he was on Herrick Ten when I was on Herrick Ten as a as a rifles bloke. And then in two thousand and ten, he was out there in Marja with the Marines, the US Marine Corps, as a, a private military contract. And you know, like I was the same, like talking to him, I was just fucking uh awestruck, you know. It was like, right, this is a guy who's you know, it, like I don't get starstruck, but I get um I get taken back by individual experiences and, you know, for someday to have, have been through so much in such a short period of, you know, lifetime, it's, you know, I was, I was taken back by his experiences and I urge anyone to go and check him out. He's a phenomenal fucking guy. Yeah. He's a bullet magnet of all bullet magnets. He is <laughs> um, like, um, but yeah, mate, it's just like every guest to be honest has been every, every guest. I don't, I've never had a guest where I've come away thinking like cock. I, I, have, I haven't had anyone like that. We've done nearly hundred episodes now. Um, and it's it, there's been something that's come out of all of them, and I think we, to be honest, mate, as well as I, I, I generally believe in life, you have to do reps on everything. You want to get fucking big arms like me, you gotta do your fucking reps. If you yeah. want to get good, at, if you want to get good at writing, if you want to get good with podcast, you gotta do your reps. And because people are like, "Wow, well, yeah, you got the hang of podcasting now," because we, we're coming on a hundred episodes. I'm like, I, I genuinely feel like I'm just getting the hang of it. Yeah, um, at about a hundred. Like we're on this this next one out will be ninety five, um. We but we've recorded a hundred. We we we've recorded a hundred. So we've got um because I'm trying to record a bit in advance, but I I just feel like the last two months, um the 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 the, the groove has got in because like now we do some episodes where it's like with a mate and we're just having a fucking laugh and I do other episodes where we're getting deep, um you know and that and I and I think now we've got I've got the balance and I'm starting to figure it out a bit more and. Um, but yeah, it's taken a hundred episodes to, to get there and there's still a lot of room for improvement. Don't get me wrong. I've definitely got more, like, I'm, I'm like, I would say that I'm still at like advanced beginner level on podcasting. If you know yeah. what I mean, there's some things I'm, some things I do, I like writing. I feel like I'm, I'm I feel like I'm advanced, not expert. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I think anyone that thinks that they can be an expert at something in a few years is probably needs to have words with himself, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been a lot, it's been a lot of fun, mate. It's like a hobby. It's a, it's it's a it's a hobby, but that it it's weird because it's a hobby that has it helps me professionally because I get to meet. It's a great excuse to meet people that then might end up doing work together, you know. So the 
you know, the Stephen Pressfield one, like afterwards, Stephen introduced me to some other people who God knows that I, well, we might end up doing some work together at some point. So yeah, it's, I don't think there's anything else out there. Like I really don't like, it's just such a great opportunity. There's just, just so many fucking wins for it. And like, there's no downside. The only downside is it takes your time up, but if you enjoy doing it, that's not a fucking downside, is it? So. Yeah, exactly. And, um, bro, I've been super fucking lucky. I, this, uh, this will be the 25th or 26th one that I've done with you. Um, and I've been so lucky as to not even have a negative comment. I think I've had like one thumbs down on <laughs> one thumb down on YouTube. So they'll like, come, mate. They'll come. Yeah, Give it yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. Listen, hey, people, wrong, people hate to see people hate to see people um, one being successful, and two people hate. There'll be people out there who wanted to start a podcast but were too lazy, and they will give you bad comments because yeah. you were too. You've done something that they were too lazy to do, and they will never let. Rather than be angry at themselves, they'll be angry at you. Yeah, listen, don't get me wrong. I know those fucking, I know those cunts uh, in, in, <laughs> in their basement fucking uh, cursing me and talking about him my back and talking shit. But you know what? I couldn't give a flying fuck. I really couldn't care less. Um, Can't please everyone, mate. Yeah, I'm not out to please anyone. I'm just out there to, to, give, <laughs> to give a service. To, well, not even a service, but to just give a, what would you call it? give content to some to people who mm. may enjoy it and if they don't want to enjoy it then they don't have to listen i don't care i don't get that's any money so- from it i don't get any value for, there's nothing other than like you said a, a hobby for me that's all it is and it's it's a good way to yeah. to, to to increase on your interpersonal skills and you know mm-hmm. conversation skills that uh that have massive transitions into the professional sector and, and whatever job you're doing so you know, like I said, that like like you said, it's, it might not necessarily um, like take off like a fucking a heartbeat, like like some people might think it does, and it's all about reps. One day I'll get there. You know, it just I'm just going to keep plodding along, and I, I don't have any goals, but I'm definitely ambitious. I just you know that we, we'll get there, um, and I'm I'm happy where we are where where I'm at right now with, with my podcast and, you know, yours is also very, you know, very professionally done as well. So, uh, I commend you from phenomenally for that. Um, it's, it's just one of those things where like, it's funny. Cause I had like, I looked at our reviews and we had like one, one star review and it was from someone who was saying, Oh, I thought this was going to be like Jocko or whatever. And it's like, well, no one can do Jocko better than Jocko. Yeah. Like Jocko's podcast is amazing, but, Jocko isn't me and I'm not Jocko. Did Jocko you... can't do what Veteran State of Mind does. Veteran State of Mind can't do what Jocko does. And it's okay to not like something, but yeah. like just, it's funny though, because you just, it's like that one person, it's like, well, I wanted this, so why haven't you made it like that? Well, because that's not what we're about, mate. And I used to get really wound up about that stuff, honestly. But thankfully now, I've done 12 books, I've done podcasting. I've known by now, because like the funny, I, I used to go for my Amazon, you'd have five star, five star, five best book ever, best book ever, next one, worst book ever. <laughs> and then you're just like, when, once you've seen it enough times, you realize that like, it's not the best book ever and it's not the worst book ever. It's, it's actually somewhere in between. Yeah. Like what, like you're never as good as you say, you're never as good as you say they are, as, you, as they say you are, and you're never as bad as they say you are. You're somewhere yeah. in the fucking middle. And as long as you're having fun doing it, then fuck it. Yeah, and I think the only thing that would get guys down um, is their ego getting in the way. And quite frankly, I've, I think I've, I, well, I definitely have control of my ego. You know, like I, I really couldn't care. Like I don't have a, a personal Instagram anymore. Like I, I don't, I really couldn't give a fuck about my personal standing. I have a professional, uh, professional uh, output that comes down to my work and that's completely different to the podcast i have the podcast as a hobby for me and hopefully one day i will be able to, uh, to make you know make some money off it and make it a, make it financially viable that it might be my job but also you need to understand that jocko willink has a guy called echo charles who does all of the fucking work to produce that shit and make it as good as it is um you know in terms of media quality but jocko willink is a fucking US Navy SEAL officer of God knows how many decades um, and I'm a, a, an extreme intellect. I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm, t- I'm giving you some infantry dates. I'm getting infantry guests on. If that's what you yeah. want, come and get it. If you want to find out how to be the, the best leader 
and the best, and you know, and and learn about strategy and learn about tactics on the battlefield from history. Go go listen to Jocko podcast because it's the fucking best thing out there. And and also, mate, like Jocko is one of the best people in his field of leadership training, if not yeah. the best. Yeah. So like. You know, this guy is not only is he an amazing officer and he's, I, I, I know I, I, we have like, uh, we have friends in common and I, I have the highest regard for Jocko. Um, I think that, I think that Jocko podcast is one of my favorite podcasts. And, um, but this guy, he's not just an expert in one field. He is an expert in multiple fields. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that he's something to aspire to. You know, so if someone said to me, you're not like Jocko podcast, I'd be like, hell no, he's fucking miles ahead of me. Like, would I like to catch up? Would I like to catch up with him? I don't think I'm on the same fucking field as him. Of course not. Yeah. But he's someone, he's someone that I look up to and someone that I aspire to be like, yeah. you know, he's, um, he's also knocked out what 200 something, 260 episodes of his podcast. So you're not even halfway there to, to what he's put out there. Um, I'm not even, but I, I look up to him, mate. But I look I'm really about ten percent of what he's done. So, like, how can you expect to be compared to Jocko when you've only done not even half? And me, for for instance, ten percent. Like, it comes down to evaluating where you are, where you're at, and understanding your your situation compared to someone else's. And if you want to compare, then if you want, to, if people do want to compare other people to themselves, or you know, I. I Let's compare veteran state of mind to the Led's podcast, the, the, the Led Wasps podcast. Yeah, go ahead. They're two different podcasts. Geraint does fucking veterans, and he he has a whole host of guests. I do infantry specific guests. That's going to be a completely different show to what what he does. Just like yours is completely different to Jocko's or, or mine or any or any any other podcast out there. Um, yeah, just because just it's got a veteran in it doesn't mean it's the same. And like that's something that people yeah. need to understand about books and they need to understand about podcasts or fucking, I don't know, coffee, whatever. <laughs> just because yeah. it's a vet, just because it's a veteran thing doesn't mean it has to be the same as any other thing because it's about at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's the vision of the person behind it. And we're all individuals and we have a different thing. So it's, um, like I know I'm a fan of H hour podcasts, I'm a fan of declassified podcasts, all different, and yeah. that's great. Um, like so, I, I I don't think I'm I'm I don't know if you like aware like Gary V, but I like his thing of like I want my fucking skyscraper, but I want everyone else to have skyscrapers too. Yeah, you yeah. know that that that's kind of like that's why I you know I, that that's the way I kind of see things. I want everybody to succeed. I, I don't see it as competition. I see it as the more podcasts that are like this, the better because everyone's going to offer their own little their own little thing. I like I watch Brooklyn Nine Nine. I love it, and then I watch Always Sunny in Philadelphia two different comedies but they're both comedies by comedians but they're two different fucking shows and that's the way i feel about podcasts and stuff yeah my, my flatmate was asking me he's like so so what's your podcast about and i says oh well i get infantry guys on and we just generally talk about their, their career and any lessons that we can learn from from that and you know just generally try and have a laugh and i just open chat and he's like all right yeah so like army guys and i'm like oh no i I'm, it's not army just to like cut in there it's not just army guys it's just specifically infantry guys and listen i'm not shitting on anyone in the army but listen if you're a pastry chef and you want to host a pastry chef show then you should not be getting people on who cook sunday roasts on your show you know what i mean you should be getting pastry chefs on that's how i was that's how i ended up explaining it to him i says like we've got our niche that's my niche that's what i know that's what i want to talk about listen there's guys all over the world who aren't even in the army that I would love to talk to. Um, and, you know, if I had started a podcast that was more open and diverse, I might be able to talk to them, but I've chosen and I will stick to my guns about sticking to an infantry podcast. And, you know, it comes down to marketing. It comes down to your USP and having a niche is very valuable. And uh, my niche at the minute is that I'm an, an infantry specific podcast. And I don't think there's another one out there at the minute. So we'll see. But um, yeah, it's it's been amazing for me and it's been great listening to the other podcasts like yourself and, uh, Andy Stamps and Jocko's and um, all those all those guys out there that that I'm interested in. Every every time I listen to one, I always learn something. So um, that's where the, that's where I'm at with it. The, the the whole industry. So and I don't really look to others to to compare how I'm doing or don't really look to numbers. As long as I'm staying consistent to the guys that do follow me, uh, then I'm I'm more than happy just staying at that. 
mate. That's the right, that's the right way to do it, mate. Um, just as, as the way I look at any project, to be honest now, I look at a project that I go, like, as long as I, like, obviously I need enough to live, but am I, enjoy, <laughs> am I, am I enjoying what I'm doing? And then that's the bottom line. I'm, if I don't take work, if I look at work and I go, this is going to feel like work, I don't do it. Yeah. Uh, mate, I'm going to have to uh, shoot off my dindins, mate. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, uh, yeah, I know I've taken, taken so much of your time, but we'll, that's all right, man. That's mate, that's here and enjoyed it. Just give me some last and final thoughts on, uh, on what your military service has meant to you and, and how you look back on it. I wouldn't trade it for the world, mate. Um, I really wouldn't. Like, it's it's a springboard for life and there was a part in my life when i was when when i just finished my service where i thought that's it that's the high point of my life nothing that i ever do is ever going to compare to what i've done now um and that's the story that you tell yourself if you tell yourself that story then it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy because you'll never open yourself up to anything else once you realize that your life is you know and i'll as an author i'll use the thing is your life is a book like your military service is a fucking gripping chapter, but it ain't the only chapter. There's a lot of other things you can do from there. And once you start looking at the service as something that you can, like almost like a relationship, you can have a great relationship. And it doesn't mean that that's only going to be the one, the only relationship you ever have in your life. And you've got to open yourself up to other experiences and be proud of what you've done and look back on it and enjoy it. Um, and you can feel sad about the sad bits and happy about the happy bits and fun about the fun bits. But you know, it's, there's so much more. There's really so much more that comes after the service. And, um, you know, you're just doing, not only are you doing yourself a disservice if you don't embrace that, but you're doing a disservice to the lads that can't because, you know, we have lost mates. And, and would, would they want you moping around and being miserable? Would they want you out there fucking smashing life? I think we all know the answer to that. Garen, an, an absolutely fantastic way to, to end this podcast. Out. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down with me. Um, any links that you want uh, to know about Geraint, they'll be down in the description below. But once again, thank you very much and, and ha have, a, have a good evening. Thank you, bro. Come on, veteran state of mind sometime. Let's do this again. 100%, bro. Thank you very much. Bye.